and we are live. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? I'm going to wait a couple of seconds to see whether people hear me. If you hear me, please write something in the chat. Let's make sure. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> It's true. Yes. Okay. So there is a delay usually. Okay. Now the yeses are coming. Thank you guys. Uh, Thanks, welcome. Lina. We are very excited to have Paul Chizik with us today. Um, reminder that we are over 77% through 2020. And uh, we are very excited to have you here for our sixth session of the Learning Salon, where we discuss bridges and contentions between biological and artificial learning. Uh, I'm Aida Momen Nejad. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, I'm co-hosting this session as usual with Jovo Joshua Vogelstein. He's a professor at Hopkins and also uh, the inimitable John Krakauer, who's also a professor at Hopkins. Uh, so gentle reminder of the rules. Everybody, please be as um, uh, respectful of each other while disagreeing. We encourage disagreement, even heated disagreement, but with a lot of respect. Uh, feel free to use the ask a question button that you see below the screen and vote on each other's questions throughout. In the chat today, uh, we have um, Brad, who's going to respond to questions of clarification you might have during the talk. A gentle reminder, the talk is about 20 minutes and then we're gonna discuss a little bit and open the floor for questions. The session is roughly two hours, so we're gonna go until six or a little over six. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you for being here. A lot of gratitude for being able to maintain this community and John will introduce Paul now. Uh, hello everybody. Um, it really is a pleasure to have Paul on. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we don't tend to go through people's credentials, but uh, Paul is a professor of neuroscience uh, at the University of Montreal in Montreal. You can see that through his window right now. Um, Paul and I actually go way back. Uh, we were Pew Fellows together in 1999 in Dartmouth for the Gazaniga Cognitive Neuroscience Summer School. Um, and we actually became friends then. Uh, we played tennis together and we argued. And I say this sincerely, this isn't sort of um, reinventing the past, um, that I knew even then that he was unusual. He was philosophical, he was thoughtful, he was different. Um, Likewise. And Paul is very rare because he's not only a, re a gifted experimentalist and computational neuroscientist, but he's just intellectual. He's interested in lots of things. He manages to look at things in a way uh, that is different from most people. Um, we've definitely had our disagreements over all sorts of things, including work on multiple plans versus multiple goals, but it's fantastic to actually be provoked by original work. Um, and then on top of all that, um, he's a scholar. And I think this article, uh, that we're gonna be discussing just shows what a <laughs> deep scholar he is. And I know, cause I've listened to him on podcasts, um, he's writing a book, um, but he's like me, he feels like he has to read a thousand books before he can write his own book. Um, and I think the, the fruits of his scholarship um, are very much apparent uh, in the article, which loads and loads of people uh, are fans of for good reason, actually. Um, so, Paul, uh, it's really great to have you here and take it away. Well, thanks a lot, John. It's very kind, especially especially coming from you. Um, you in all the previous uh, casts, I always noticed you always have some book that you've read that's relevant to what the speaker is <laughs> talking about. So, wow. cool. they're, they're, um, they're, just, they're just props. Yeah, well, I don't know. You seem to know the inside of them, at least, at least a little bit. There you go. The yeah, music of yeah. life, there you go. <laughs> okay, um, well, anyway, thank you very much for inviting me um, to the Learning Salon. I, I got to say, I really like this forum. I think you're really onto something. We really need more debate in uh, in science. You know, good constructive debate, not, not like politics. 
Um, so I think that I think you've really accomplished that. I'm looking forward to it. So anyway, so uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, I'm a computational neuroscientist and a monkey neurophysiologist, but but I'm also, as as John noted, a, a closet philosopher. So uh, what I'm going to present is more on that sort of my not my day job so much. Um, so let me share a screen here, uh, uh, and we'll do window. Okay, and all right, so can you see my thing? Yes, you can. All right, very good. So I will start with this. Okay, <clears throat> all right, anyway, so I'm going to talk about rethinking behavior and from an evolutionary perspective. And what I mean by that is um, really addressing the conceptual taxonomy or the, the parts list, if you will. Uh, and, and traditionally, behavior is seen as consisting of a variety of processes related to perception, um, uh, action, as well as cognition, things like working memory, decision making, etc. cetera. And um, this, this is, of course, very incomplete sort of conceptual taxonomy um, and very simplified. And I don't know how seriously people really take this, but it does have a very strong influence on the way we do science because it defines the questions that we ask. So questions like how are memories encoded, stored, and retrieved? How does the brain make decisions by comparing costs and benefits, et cetera? And also, we use these concepts to interpret the functional roles of specific brain regions. Now, as many of you know, that's not working out so so well. Uh, it's difficult to map these concepts to the brain. I'll give you one example, which is asking the question of what is the functional role of the posterior parietal cortex? This region has for decades been implicated in um, attentional phenomena, but for just as long, it's been also implicated in intention, the intention to perform an action. Um, uh, even in the, the very same uh, specific cells, um, now, that's more than a, just a semantic argument because attention is kind of like the input to cognition, uh, the lens through which uh, information enters cognition, whereas intention is kind of like the output. Once you've made a decision, you intend to do something. So these concepts are really fundamentally incompatible. Uh, and the parietal cortex has also been implicated in a variety of uh, sensory processes, uh, motor-related processes, as, a, as well as certain kinds of decision-making. And so it's hard to say how to uh, interpret this region in, in the context of this. And that's true for many other regions. In fact, these concepts do not readily map to the brain, as many people have said. Now, I would say it really shouldn't be altogether that surprising when we consider where these concepts come from. Um, so the basic distinction between perception, cognition, and action, I think really comes from the very old philosophical idea of dualism, that there is some non-physical mind. Because that idea forced early philosophers like Plato, the, from Plato to Descartes, to conceive of interfaces between the physical world and the non-physical mind. Perception that presents the world to the mind through the lens of attention, and action that plays out the mind's intentions onto the world. Now, the concept of the non-physical mind has been rejected and replaced with a computational concept of cognition. Nevertheless, the architecture remains. And I think part of the reason why this architecture remains is because it's just part of the language we use to discuss behavior. Uh, in fact, Russ Poldrack recently estimated that about 80% of psychological terms uh, used to discuss behavior were already in use before the year 1800, which is long before psychology was actually a science. And so many people suggest that perhaps it's time for a new taxonomy. And I just want to emphasize that I'm by no means the only person raising this issue. There's a, a, actually a whole um, seminar series uh, on this. And, and if you're interested, I'll be presenting on, on that in, on, on Monday. Um, the, and, and people have been asking this actually for decades. Now, normally, um, the defense that comes from sort of the classic cognitive science view is what, what I could call, one could call the, the my way or the highway uh, defense, which is to say that if you reject these concepts, then you must be some kind of naive uh, reductionist or radical behaviorist or just against the whole concept of a science of psychology. Now, I just want to assure you that I'm not a naive reductionist or radical behaviorist. I do think high-level concepts are necessary 
to understand the brain. We need both top-down and bottom-up approaches. I just don't think these um, uh, high-level concepts are necessarily the right ones, at least maybe not all of them. So uh, I, like many others, are searching for a new taxonomy. Now, the traditional way, one, one typical approach is to decompose um, the brain into functions, uh, information processing functions, and then search for specific neural systems that implement them. What I'm going to describe is a different strategy for break, uh, carving up the problem of behavior, which, which I call phylogenetic refinement. It's really the comparative approach of bi biology applied to theoretical neuroscience. And the basic idea is to follow in the footsteps of evolu evolution. And the logic behind this is extremely simple. Um, we all accept. I think, that the brain was produced by a process of evolution. Well, if we accept that, then it seems useful to ask, what were the actual steps in that process? Um, and, and now I'm, I'm going to describe some of those steps. But first, I want to just um, correct some misconceptions that I think many people, um, at least some people, have about evolution. And we can just debate these later. One is that evolution is nature's way of finding answers to problems posed by the world. And that's not entirely true because evolution doesn't actually identify problems. It just introduces variations into populations of animals and then just happens to favor those that happen to accomplish something that used to be a problem. So in other words, you never define the problem until long after it's solved. There's no goal or metric that evolution is trying to optimize in some way. Um, so it, it doesn't actually find optimal solutions, even though it does improve things. And the reason uh, the solutions it finds are not optimal is because for a variation to be selected, it must first be possible. And because of the constraints of, of ancestry, the vast majority of potential solutions never even enter the game. So there's no real surface uh, that, you, that you can uh, minimize some metric on. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the genome does not describe a blueprint of the organism. Um, it actually describes, and not like a connectome for, for the nervous system, it describes a recipe for building an organism, a developmental process, which, like any recipe, um, consists of stages. And each stage um, depends on certain assumptions about earlier stages. So for that reason, you can't just change some early stage in the process. No matter how useful that would be, it's going to screw up later stages and uh, result in a big mess. So evolution really can't just redesign things. It, it can only do a couple of, of modifications that will be viable. It can extend the developmental process. Uh, it can differentiate and specialize uh, different uh, parts of the system. And therefore, organization in, in biological systems emerges through the progressive differentiation, specialization, and elaboration of ancestral systems. And it's massively constrained by the organization of the ancestor. Now, this is actually, I think, good news, because this is why we can use evolution to help us carve up behavior, because we can reconstruct what this was. And it actually gives us a kind of taxonomy, at least a neuroanatomical taxonomy of what, of what the parts list is. So I'm going to, in my talk, um, the next slide is going to be a complicated one. It's going to be a brisk walk through evolutionary history. So here is the phylogenetic tree of animals expanded uh, almost exclusively on, along the lineage that leads to humans. And I'm going to go follow along this uh, lineage in the next 12, 13 minutes or so. Now, I'm gonna, it's going to be incredibly fast. It's going to be ridiculously fast. It's going to be very hard for you to really retain much uh, of the things I say. But just uh, take note of the fact that the, pr the, the story is continuous and it involves progressive differentiation of, of behavioral systems. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, way back, 3.8 billion years ago, at the origins of life. And there's a general consensus that life began with autocatalytic sets, so self-sustaining sets of chemical reactions, which created lab replication and basic metabolism. Now, metabolism works by keeping some um, nutrients um, in, in, in sort of in balance through negative feedback. And once you enclose this kind of thing in a membrane, you can now distinguish two types of metabolism. Uh, metabolism that's entirely within the membrane. We call that physiology. But some things uh, that you need, you can't create locally. You have to absorb them from the environment, and they're non-uniformly distributed. So what you can do is simply move. You simply move and absorb those things. And this is behavior. It's really a extension of metabolism beyond the, the, the or, uh, organism's boundary. 
Um, so it's still really about control. And as, as people for more than 100 years have suggested, the real task of behavior is not so much building knowledge about the environment, but rather the task is to complement the dynamics of the environment so that such that the entire organism environment system flows towards desirable states in the language of dynamical systems. So now the first nervous systems appeared around here in multicellular animals as a specialization of the ectoderm, the outer layer. Um, and neurons in these early animals were distributed rather diffusely as a net across the body, uh, the sort of cup-shaped body. And an early specialization was um, described by Arendt and others, um, was the apical nervous system at the top of the body, which was rich in chemosensory and photosensory receptors and, and, and uh, mostly communicated through um, hormonal secretions. And a blastoporal nervous system, um, which around the blastopore, which controlled contractions that could make the animal is suck in or expel water. Um, these animals moved around the world through something called levee walks or levee flights, where you uh, sort of move locally for a certain period of time, exploiting a local patch, and every once in a while make a longer bout of movement to go somewhere else. And this is a very effective way to cover um, uh, and, and forage. Um, now, Thomas Hills and others have suggested that um, the control, the, the arbitration between these phases was the original role of dopamine that essentially tonic dopamine is high when you're doing well and so you sort of want to stay local but once you deplete the local environment you may want to your tonic dopamine drops and you may want to make a longer bout explore somewhere else um so now the organization the apical and blastoporal nervous system can still be seen in the darians like jellyfish but in our branch the bilaterians the body elongated the blastopore fused to form a digestive tube and the apical and blastoporal nervous systems merged at one end of the body. This is where the head would be, but for now, it's effectively what we call, now call the hypothalamus. Now, that organization remains in protostomes, which includes all insects, mollusks, annelids, etc. But in our branch, the deuterostomes, the body inverted dorsoventrally, and the neural plate folded into a tube, creating the general uh, plan of all uh, chordate nervous systems. All of us our nervous system is essentially a tube composed of segments called neuromeres. The first of which is sort of analogous to the hypothalamus and the rest to the rest of the nervous system. Now, these early chordates, so here's a side view. Um, here's a sort of unfolded top view of the neural tube, um, forged around the world through this kind of dopamine dependent search. They also uh, possessed an escape circuit uh, which started with a photosensitive patch, a single photosensitive patch of cells that projected to something uh, called a tectum, which then projected ipsilaterally downstream uh, so that if a shadow falls on these cells, on the animal, uh, it scurries away quickly. Um, uh, in early vertebrates, the single photosensitive patch split into two patches that migrated to the sides of the head. And the initial bilateral projections became pruned down to favor the contralateral input. And, and this was useful because um, now if a shadow falls on your right patch, you'll first turn to the left before scurrying away. So it's, you get oriented escape behaviors. Uh, later on, this, these um, retinotectal uh, circuits expanded, conferring a kind of topography of escape behaviors from different locations in space. And part of the tectum specialized, the rostral part specialized into an approach circuit through contralateral projection. So now you'll approach towards the site of stimulation. And early on in these early animals, the selection between whether to approach or avoid something was based on very simple rules, simple key stimuli, stimuli. Like for example, if something is large and expanding quickly, then you want to escape. Um, in these early chordates, again, we had this sort of dopamine dependent uh, foraging pattern, but this elaborated in early vertebrates through an expansion of part of the hypothalamus into what would become the telencephalon, uh, consisting of two sections, the pallium, which received sensory information about the state of the animal, and the subpallium, which would become the basal ganglia, which selected between different behaviors like approach and avoidance. And this region also now um, uh, to, uh, received dopaminergic input that was more punctate, that said what you just did was right within this context, um, setting, setting up essentially reinforcement learning, which of course was very important for the early vertebrates. Um, the pallium relatively quickly specialized into two systems, 
one, the ventrolateral system, which was um, specialized for the sort of more local behaviors and approaching things, ingesting things, learning what's good to eat, et cetera. And the medial pallium, which specialized for the exploration aspect, for going somewhere else and navigating. And this would become the hippocampus. Um, Jod vertebrates added, uh, elaborated this part of the hindbrain here um, to cancel out the sensory consequences of movement. Uh, um, through a, a, a series of, of elaborations, common mode rejection, efferents copy, the reafferents principle essentially, and eventually uh, an adaptive filter like, of, uh, like, like in the cerebellum. And this was very important because this could now predict sensory consequences and this allowed our ancestors to get bigger and faster and become much better predators. Um, in bony fish, the telencephalon continued to expand, and we have specializations such as the septal nuclei, the amygdala nuclei, the ventral stratum and pallidum, et cetera, still organized, though, into this local exploitation subsystems versus a long-range exploration subsystem. Uh, when we got out on land uh, as tetrapods, we encountered a uh, very different world, um, a larger visual range, a wider variety of affordances, novel demands like thirst, et cetera, and a dramatic expansion of interactive behavior that was uh, accompanied by expansion of the, the pallium in particular. And different branches did it differently. Amphibians expanded primarily the medial pallium uh, to navigate their, the navigation system. They relied still on the tectal circuits, but the medial pallium was important because if you're an amphibian, you really don't want to lose your way back to water. Um, the um, <clears throat> Seropsids, which leads to rep, re, lead to reptiles and birds, uh, they uh, dominated the diurnal niche. And so they relied heavily on the optic tectum, as well as the tectorecipient parts of the pallium, the uh, ventral and lateral pallium. And uh, this would become the dorsal ventricular ridge of, of um, reptiles and birds. In our ancestors, the synapsids, the, the ancestors of mammals, they became nocturnal. And therefore, they relied less on vision. They, in fact, lost trichromatic vision, relied more, more on olfaction, somatic sensation, et cetera. And they expanded this green part here, the dorsal pallium that, developed, that um, took on this inside-out development and columnar architecture and expanded dramatically. Um, now, in those early mammals, you get a parcellation of the neocortex into specialized regions for different modalities like visual, auditory, gustatory, somatosensory, etc. Um, organized essentially into two cortical sheets. According to Barbara Finlay, all mammals have a dorsomedial sheet, which is spatial. And here you have uh, in sort of topographic uh, sensory motor control of visual, visual motor control for different actions like walking, biting, etc. Uh, the ventral lateral uh, cortical sheet non-spatial, mostly for pro processing the kinds of key stimuli that lead you to evaluate which actions may be the most appropriate in a given context. Uh, in primates, the primates returned back to the diurnal world and, and expanded their vision and expanded dramatically the temporal, frontal, and parietal cortex, so much so that the whole thing curled around the insula, creating the familiar shape of the primate brain. Uh, but it's still organized in those two sheets. A uh, much expanded repertoire of different actions, the different types of behaviors that uh, primates are capable of. Um, and also the temporal court, uh, regions um, went beyond key stimulus detection to full-fledged object cat categorization and recognition, but still in the service of evaluating and selecting between actions. All right, so that was a breakneck, super fast walk through evolutionary history. And if people have questions, I can come back to any of these uh, points. Um, a couple of conclusions, though, I, I want to make sort of general conclusions, is that throughout this whole process, uh, the, the job has not really been to build knowledge, encode information about the world, but fundamentally to control interaction with the world. And the, the story of the evolution of the brain and behavior is the continuous expansion of that control to new niches and more sophisticated uh, interactions. Um, so, I, and I just want to say, you know, this is a sort of more complete version of it, but, but it's really a work in progress. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm working on a book, and I'm doing this uh, sort of as I learn, as I read this stuff. And I don't know whether I've got it all right, okay? I, I'm speculating in some places, 
Um, and I, I don't know if I have it all right. So I'm not that confident that everything I've told you here is, is correct. But one thing that I am quite confident about is that ultimately we're going to need something like this to make sense of the brain. That a continuous story of brain evolution is actually possible. The data is there. And I think it's necessary. Because there really do exist real distinctions between biological systems at a neuroanatomical and functional level. And they have an the empirically definable history that we can infer. And, th and the reason is that each ancestral stage constrained the evolution of descendants. And for that reason, a chronological approach is necessary to understand the brain. It's just not going to make sense until we have some idea of this, of this history. And I can give you an example about the vertebrate retina. Why is the vertebrate retina ridiculously inverted? And the point is that the organization of the brain produced by this process is not going to, is not going to resemble the, the kinds of taxonomies that our philosophical traditions have led us to. Uh, and also, it leads to a different model of brain function. It's not about serial input-output. It's, it's really fundamentally parallel nested feedback loops. It's not encoding or decoding of information fundamentally. Fundamentally, it's about control of interaction, which may, in some cases, involve some encoding and decoding. And then, the, again, the evolution of brain and behavior is a continuous expansion of that control. So the taxonomy that I would suggest is not this, not these concepts, but rather something like this. This is a little bit like a summary of what I went through, some of the distinctions that, that occurred. And uh, the advantage of this kind of taxonomy is it respects the actual history of how um, different capacities and brain systems emerged. And also, this one actually does map to the brain pretty well, I, I would claim. We can actually use this to interpret different parts of the brain. So if you want more detail on this, uh, there's, a, there's the paper that, that, um, that's linked from the website. But there's also another paper that I wrote with some colleagues where we did uh, sort of deconstructed the concept of attention uh, in this way. Um, anyway, with that, I'll, I'll end and I'll thank you for your attention. Okay. You blew Ida away. It was that amazing. Thanks. <laughs> Can you unshare? Thank you. All right. I should unshare, though. Huh? Let's see. Okay. Thank I you. Can close it. There we go. So, should I? What do you? Should I? Can I go or should you go? I don't care. Please. <laughs> um, so, Paul. Um, you know, I was uh, not when I was at Columbia doing med school to alleviate boredom. I took a number of courses in uh, literature at Columbia and ended up taking some classes on deconstruction. Um, and you know, there you learn to sort of read a text both with regard to the intention of the author and also to sort of take a look at what's going on underneath, right? So. What I find fascinating about the article, which is a wonderful work of scholarship, and just I've read it several times over the last year or two, um, and I genuinely like it. Um, but I feel like you have multiple agendas going on in parallel in this paper, which is allowed, obviously, right? I mean, you can do whatever you like, right? One, I think, um, is something that is highly commendable, which is it's incredibly embarrassing how little evolution is taught in graduate programs, in neuroscience in general. I mean, it's just the most powerful idea in biology and it barely gets yeah. mentioned, right? It would be like, it doesn't happen in physics, right? In physics, you have to sort of go through the history of the topic, but in somehow in biology, you're more likely to be given six lectures on optogenetics and none on evolution, right? So it's, it's, it's absurd, right? So to that degree, I think, and for me and for you, those of us who are interested in sensory motor, I think there are all sorts of delicious nuggets and clues right there if one looked. You know, that, you know the pallium, the basal ganglia. Yeah. It, 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 it's amazing how one could probably just short circuit so many mistakes if one were to actually look at how these structures evolved. You know, and, you know, Stan Grillner's made this point, right, about yeah. take, a, take a closer look, right? Um, go back to the lamprey and it's all there, right? Um, so that's all great. Um, but what else are you trying to do? Well, you kind of pussyfoot around it a bit, but you are 
basically a deflationist, right? You want a sensory motor story for cognition. You want to talk about affordances and you want to talk, you want to sort of get away from representations and you have a little bit about it in the paper. But once again, you're part of that club that wants to sort of not just get rid of the wrong psychological categories, but kind of see whether you can deflate them and have a sensory motor version of them. So that's another, and we know that you're in that camp to a degree. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, so, and, and what I'm you a card carrying Gibsonian. If there was yeah, a card. You're a car, yeah, 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 you know, you're, you know, whatever that, you know, you know. And so what you're trying to do uh, and is is I'm going to wow my audience with the amazing evolutionary scholarship that I've done, right? And really tell this story so that then I can sort of cash it out in the second half of my article and tell a Gibsonian story. Now, quite frankly, the first half, that scholarship dump, which is wonderful, doesn't allow you to suddenly then go into your Gibsonian anti-representational. And you have a very funny line in your article when you so say, I'm not really sure why anyone writes an article about embodied cognition. In other words, who's reading your article? Who wants to know the knowledge from your article? In other words, what's the story behind writing papers in journals with language to have arguments like we're having right now um, on this platform, nothing, right? You basically say, so what you basically do is you've, you've, you've written a promissory note, right? And that promissory note is that all this dense scholarship about the sensory motor system and its evolution is going to lend credence to a slightly breezy, one day we're gonna get to psychology through this, right? But quite frankly, I just don't see it, right? I, it, it, it's, it's based on faith launched by a lot of dense sensory motor material. Well, right? I and, don't and, think and, that you can't address psychological issues from this thing. Well, I mean, you say um, it, and we'll get to that. But you say Well, I, I can do that. I took out those slides. I, well, I well right, but I, yes, of course you did. So, and then, you know, in... So there are two arguments I want to, one is that somehow if you want to build a modern apartment building, you have to go to Egypt first and see how the pyramids were built. Okay, which seems slightly odd, right? Um, and, and two, in one sentence, you claim that your sensory motor approach dispenses immediately with a symbol grounding problem, right? It's just Voila, it's gone. Um, I mean, it's just so just so yeah, people know. You know let, me, let me answer that one actually, maybe because 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 you're asking a very general set of questions. Uh, and may, maybe yeah. I can just kind of get at some of them before before the before I forget the first ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, I admit I do have an agenda in the sense that I I I like Gibson's um Gibson's alternative, and I like Piaget's alternative. And uh, Bill Powers and Ashby. They're, they're, these people have been saying these kinds of sensory motor foundations for cognition for a long time. And I like those not because of evolution, but because on their own merits, they actually do address some of these problems. And I would claim that Gibson does address the problem of meaning much better than any approach going from the other direction, from the non uh, sort of sensory motor interaction direction. So I actually think that um, having read those people and then reading psychological uh, literature, tearing their hair out about the problem of meaning, I feel like, no, no there's no problem. Just the problem is that you're, it's like you're trying to pole vault before you've learned how to walk. Don't address the question of linguistic, um, you know, construction of language and how the language is transmitted from one person to another and how is meaning attached to the to the sounds that that are uttered don't think of it that way think of it as interacting systems within which symbolic uh, means of interactions emerged over time um, uh, frankly from an evolutionary standpoint in a relatively continuous way and just reached level uh, very sophisticated levels in humans now I'm not saying that I'm going to be able to just waltz over from, uh, you know, uh, great apes to humans. 
uh, and I won't, uh, in fact, and I think that's the limitation of this method, is it can only go so far as we have alternative species to look at. So in the end, we're not going to get to explain everything about human behavior with this kind of phylogenetic approach. But, but first of all, we're 99% of the way there in terms of years, which is, I think, pretty good. And second of all, we will arrive at a set of baseline constraints that any theory of humans has to respect, right? If you could actually uh, have a theory of primate behavior that captures the richness of it, and it's, and it's pretty rich, right? Uh, it's pretty rich. They have pretty rich social structures, pretty rich communications. The cognition is, is impressive. So if we could get to that point, then I think that would be a valuable thing to put out there for the field and say, okay, now, for the people who really understand humans, which, by the way, includes me as well, um, whatever theories you propose, they have to be compatible with this. They are. This is a set of constraints that now you have to respect. You can't just say, oh, well, well you know, Paul, it's Paul, all, Paul, you know. Paul, just, so, just, so I think you get at these issues and you, and you provide something that... Uh, demystifies some of the things that I think psychologists get into because they're going from the wrong side. They're, well, they're well going, first of all, I, I, first of all, just a couple of things to that, right? Yeah. One is that the idea that there are these straw men and women psychologists who are somehow unaware of the notion of constraints seems very odd to me. Two, there's a big difference between talking about constraints and talking about explaining from the bottom up. You mustn't conflate the fact that we have to operate within constraints. That's true of physics as well as biology, right? So let me give you an example. And you actually say something in your article about, uh, you actually have this quote where you say, functional decomposition and natural selection do not mix. Yeah, that's from Hendrix Chance. Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's actually just not true. I mean, Peter Sterling and Simon Laughlin wrote a whole book on the principles of neural design where they show very convincingly that things, for example, like the, the construction of the mitochondrial electron transport chain are near optimal, right? So in other words, his whole book is about the optimality within constraints. Second, in that article, they talk about the jump from glycolysis to the electron transport chain, which has a huge qualitative jump going from two molecules of ATP to, I think, 36. Now, your argument would be, well, you have to stare at glycolysis for ages no, no. before trying to have a look at mitochondria. And that anyone no. who looks at mitochondria is a naive psychologist before they no, look at no. glycolysis. <laughs> right, but you, you see, you, the, the thing is, is that you, you create, evolution is great, sensory motor systems are great, constraints are great. But you can't just say sophisticated, more sophisticated, more abstract. Those are just your filler words for something that you don't understand, which psychologists will probably do a better job explaining what you mean by abstract or sophisticated than a worm will. But I'm not saying I'm not saying you should ignore the human. I'm saying you shouldn't ignore the rest. You yourself were lamenting that in neuroscience we don't learn about evolution. Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. We should learn about evolution and we should look at both the monkey and the human and the two amino acid thing and the, and the full, uh, you know, I, I don't know the book you're referring to, so I don't know the details. My point is, if you look at the systems, all of them, right, including, you know, um, uh, lamprey, you know, it, it, if you try to in, infer early stages as well as intermediate stages, as well as the final stage, which is the human, right, if you don't ignore everything else, you'll have a better picture. I'm not saying you should ignore the human and try to entirely think about lamprey. Um, you know, if you're interested in the human like I am, you do actually want, you do actually want to connect. Well, I'll, just finish, I'll just finish by saying that you, you sort of like a NECA cube oscillate between your more reasonable stance, which is that we should send out all our hounds, we should look at everything, right, which is great, and your anti-representationalist, sensory motor deflationist stance. But let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me respond and, and to I'm that. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm very, very for the first. I'm utterly unconvinced by the second. Okay, let me give you an answer to, the sec to that uh, anti-representationalist thing. My point is, I am not, whoops, oh, 
Okay, sorry. Um, I'm not anti-representationalist. In fact, I think uh, it's useful to think about, and I think I touch upon it a little bit in the article, but not, not so much. Think about um, representation in a more um, sort of general way, okay? The, the problem with representation, right, is you have these two camps, right? And it's, and it's, like, it's like American politics, right? One camp is just completely everything relies on representation. You can't do the simplest thing without having a re representation of, of the problem and whatever. And then there's the other camp, which is like, no, there's no such thing as representation. This is the very radical behaviorist uh, sort of called ra radi radical embodied cognitive science, right? Now, these camps are spending all their time arguing against each other. And now you you seem to think I'm in the set in this radical camp that's anti-representationalist, but I'm not because I do believe representations do exist and are used in the brain. And in many ways, even like, like good old fashioned AI type stuff, maybe. Not, but, but what I'm saying is that if you now think about evolution of those representations, where could these representations come from? So, so and the way I would re respond to this, I have a slide on this, but maybe I don't need to show it. Uh, let's think about two poles of, of types of representations. On the one hand, you have purely pragmatic representation. So this is just like something that co-varies with the external world simply through dynamical coupling, right? Like any part of a sensory motor controller, right? It's pragmatic. It's not trying to convey knowledge. It's just trying to guide you towards a piece of food or something, right? Um, and then on the other hand, you have descriptive representations, which are decodable. They're sort of context-free. Uh, they're objective. They, they, you could decode knowledge about the world from those things, okay? Now, what I would say is, okay, instead of arguing about which exists, let's think about how um, one could emerge from the other in evolution. And I'll give you three examples. Uh, well, I'll give you one example for now. Um, I think the earliest example in evolutionary uh, history of the descriptive representation comes in the context of um, cognitive maps, essentially. So imagine an early animal that uh, forages around the world and looks and is looking for food, right? And it's building a cognitive map, essentially, in the medial pallium of where food sources are in relationship to landmarks or, or gradients or something. Um, you know, many studies of navigation in, in, in fish, et cetera, would be relevant to this. And so it has a kind of a, a system for navigating around when you're hungry because that's what it satisfies. It's part of the control system that controls your nutrient state, okay? And, and it's able to do this, and next time it's hungry, it's able to find this, the, the uh, food source. And all the representations within that system are pretty pragmatic. They're very, very much colored by the state of hunger and the motivation, et cetera. But it becomes more and more useful for such an animal to, to gradually divorce these contexts from the state representation. So now, if you if you see a certain kind of plant uh, when you're not hungry, well, if you detach that knowledge from the context, then you can build a cognitive map when you're just swimming around for any reason, and then later come back when you are hungry. And so it gradually detaches itself from context, and you get something that looks like a objective knowledge of the world. If you look at, for example, um, the visual system as well, there's, 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 you know, I don't deny that in the visual system of, of monkeys, there are things that detect classes of objects. We see that. There are cells that respond to food objects. Well, in the insula, there are cells that respond to food objects only when you're hungry uh, and not if you're not hungry. And, and you know, it's, it makes some evolutionary um, sense, logic, to have both levels, a descriptive level and a pragmatic level. And I think if we can come up with these kinds of stories, and of course it it's, remains to be tested, if we could come up with this, we could get out of this whole, you know, this whole pointless extremist debate that, that we've had about representations. And then we can talk about how representations might emerge. Language is another example, but I'll, I'll stop there. I guess my point is I'm not really anti-representationalist. I know I sound like it, because I, I, you know, it's so heavily on sensory motor control and and dynamical systems and Gibsonian ideas. But that doesn't mean I'm, I, I deny the presence of you know knowledge in the brain, an abstract, very abstract knowledge. 
Ida. I think confident Ida will want to respond to that. <laughs> You want me to go? She's pointing at someone. You, you can't unmute? Mm, interesting. Oh my God, who managed to do that? Because we'll have to try that again. <laughs> hey, I don't. Right. Should I? I'll un, I, I tried unmuting her. I'm going to kick you out and invite you back in. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can get her back because I'm pretty confident she's going to disagree with, with everything. Um, oh, I'll just wait a minute to see if that works. Okay. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think the solution, John, is for me to never unmute myself. So, that we don't... <laughs> so Paul, um, I first want to say I really, obviously, I really enjoyed the paper. I've told you before. Um, it's very well written. I really appreciate the scholarship as John was appreciating it as well. I think there are aspects of it that I do see it's important even for those of us who take inspiration from bio biology and cognition to build uh, sort of biologically inspired AI. Um, what I'm confused about is that you're asking us to change the way psychology has been looking at its concepts and you're using the concepts that psychologists invented to describe the alternative. The term cognitive maps, the entire sort of tradition that started with Tolman, and it didn't it didn't start with his 1948 uh, sort of uh, review, but it started in the 20s. So we have a hundred years in psychology departments, not just at Berkeley, but a lot of places, as we see in his 1948 uh, review, a lot of people working on this in opposition to the behaviorist tradition, and so. When you talk about folk psychology terms that come from the 1800s, and then your solution is to use notions of representation that are akin to what happened when cognitive maps evolved, it seems like you are where psychology was 100 years ago. And it seems like perhaps in this course of evolution, we would want to also sort of look at the evolution of psychology, so to speak. What I do want to say is, the entire tradition of cognitive maps, as well as those of us who build models of it in reinforcement learning, so uh, with representation learning, uh, various computational models that have been proposed. One thing that I think I'm, I'm, I'm aligned with your article about, which is a maybe more minor point, and it's something that in fact at Microsoft Research we are building with colleagues, is this notion of homeostasis, which seems to be left out a little bit of notions of reward-seeking behavior. And the fact that you, you would like to tie that into an organism that has evolved to maintain a certain level of homeostasis with its explore-exploit uh, behavior, I think that's an insight that a lot of uh, modeling frameworks, including the reinforcement learning framework, needs to take it more into account. There are folks that have already written papers about this in the past at least 10 years, the ones that I'm familiar with. They've written about how uh, hunger, or sorry, how pain might be a useful sort of signal uh, uh, as a kind of an intermediate uh, step to avoid long-term issues, or they talk about using reinforcement learning to be used in a homeostat homeostatic way. So I think that the insight perhaps that I do take away from what you're saying is, let's look at an organism within an environment and not just focus on one cognitive function that is suitable to one particular task. And I'm very sympathetic to that. But what I'm not sure about is whether the history of psychology in the past hundred years haven't in fact done a lot of work in that direction. And I'm not quite sure where you do stand in terms of philosophy of mind and representations you're talking about. So is it that you're entirely anti-functionalist and you're no. saying 
that's what I'm getting, that it's not an anti-functionalist. If that is the case, then the evolution of similar functions that can be abstracted across humans, crows, and machines, and various kinds of machines for that matter, that can be akin to planning behavior, for instance, that we can look at the evolution in the crows and that another branch, humans, or anything mammalian, or another branch, which is robots and AI. How did that develop there or in reinforcement learning or various approaches to that? They, they each might have a different sort of um, path to get there. And what I do wonder, if you are a functionalist, and if there are different paths to intelligence or particular functions, and if you do name certain functions the same way that psychologists do, like or certain sort of representations such as cognitive maps, and in case you're, and if you are arguing for the importance of the sort of continuous lineage, but you are making jumps in evolution because we can't really follow the continuous lineage. <clears throat> then I'm a little bit confused about the conceptual or philosophical framework from which you are arguing things. One thing I'm confused about is how, where, where do you stand in the functionalist sort of um, uh, trajectory? Where do you stand with regards to behaviorism? And also, uh, where do you think those cuts in evolution for the steps for, for instance, developing intelligence uh, should be drawn? Like, where do you draw those boundaries? Should I just say, oh, you know, whatever animal started or whatever sort of entity started some kind of homeostasis, then caught rat, caught human? Or is it, what, what, where do you draw that ladder? How do well, you draw let, let me Let me answer, because the question right now is, if, the question right now is like six recursive uh, sub-questions in it, and I'm not going to be able to unpack them. Um, so I guess one one question is, you, you one point is, um, you said I'm asking uh, to undo psychology, but using psychological terms. Part of the reason is because because I, I have no other option to express what I mean. I think the concept of cognitive maps, yes, it's an old classic psychological concept that that, that has been used to argue against behaviorists' ideas, etc. I, I actually I don't think it's such a bad concept. I mean, you know, um, I just think it often comes packaged with some that aren't so good. You know, there's many things in the t classical taxonomy that I think are right on. I mean, forward models, I think, are, are, are fundamental and very important. Uh, that's a good idea. Reinforcement learning, absolutely fundamental stuff. So I'm not saying throw it all away, right? I'm just saying each concept needs to answer to the constraint of evolution. Is it actually compatible with an evolutionary story and if so great and i think cognitive maps is one that that might be uh and we could look at particular uh transitions in the um uh sort of com comparative uh phylogenetic uh tree to to look at you know how the medial medial pallium of sharks uh helps them navigate or or fish and, and, you know so we could look at the emergence of these things by picking the right species. And of, we're, of course, we're limited by, by the fact that so many have died off. So the point is, I don't think all the concepts should just be thrown out. I just think all of them need to be confronted with this additional set of constraints. And so like the attention paper that I mentioned there, that does that to attention. And it doesn't reject all concept of attention, but it does reject the concept that there's one thing that we call attention and it's not right and just like decision making you know there's hypothalamic decisions there are tactile decisions there are sub sub uh pallial i mean they're just different they're different mechanisms they need to be addressed that way um the, the question about um functionalism um yeah i say I, i'm a functionalist in the sense that that i i want to think about function and i think it's important to 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 not just be bottom up but i don't believe that the things that animals do are necessarily going to be, um, it's not like, I don't believe that birds and humans have independently discovered some kind of a platonic noumenon called cognition that allows them to do these sophisticated things. They've, they've both sort of taken different paths to the same thing. Maybe, but I think it's more likely that they both took different paths from their common ancestor 350 million years ago that didn't do those things. They both took different paths to solve certain kinds of problems. And although the problems might look to us similar and we might classify them similarly, we should be careful because 
until we followed, I think, the, the path to humans and the path to birds, only then, only if we understand the actual mechanisms, can we, can we say that they're similar. And so I don't think we should just say, there is something called cognition. Let's go find it in the animal kingdom. All right, birds have it. Ma uh, mammals have it based on some definition. Uh, octopi have it. All right. And therefore, all these creatures discovered this thing that we've defined. No, I think what we should do is lay off on the definition, which immediately constrains our thinking. Follow those animals, the animals that you care about the most, follow through, try to understand how they accomplish the things they accomplish. And th at that point, now you can discuss whether the mechanisms are similar. You know, flight is something that's constrained by the laws of thermodynamics. But I'm not sure cognition is a thing that's constrained so precisely that every animal has to, you know, arrive at the same, you know, platonic thing. So I, I, sorry, I sorry. don't who, believe who, who, that we can just define this. Is there anyone sorry? who, is there anyone who, what is the, what is the uh, philosophical or scientific theory that claims that all animals should arrive at the same platonic thing? Well, there know. isn't, but okay, I'm just yeah. saying that when you, when you, when you ask, and I've been asked this question before, um, you know, maybe I'm not answering your question, but somebody else's. Yeah, that you know, well, what about what about birds? What about octopi? Uh, you know, they they can do these things. So why are you not following down that path? And I'm saying is that well, I I think I, I'd be very curious about somebody following down that path, but it's a lot of work, um, and uh, and I'm not sure we should assume that the path that leads to humans and the path that leads to octopi are going to have enough similarities that we're going to learn from one to the other. Maybe we will, and I think it's worthwhile, but I'm not, I'm saying it's, I don't think it's appropriate to make that assumption at the start of the process. So to be clear, the argument that octopi, birds, uh, crows, and humans come up with a certain kind of planning or cognition is the functionalist argument that says, in spite of having different phylogenetic paths, they reach at the same function. There is a way in which the function is not that much uh, reliant on the similarity of the paths, but it's more important at the similarity of function. And that's why that uh, argument, that very profoundly functionalist argument would be in disagreement with the way that you seem to be yeah. equating a particular capacity with a particular path. <clears throat> I think that I think that argument rests on on some very precarious assumptions. I, I'm not saying it can't be true. I'm just saying if I'm gonna bet, I would bet uh, not. Uh, I, I I mean unless you know unless you can unless you know data shows otherwise. I think that would be very unsafe position to take at the at the start. So I would take the position saying let instead of defining the thing and then seeking its its expression in different animals, let's lay off on the definition. Um, uh, let's 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 be a bit more careful and sort of um, hesitant to to predefine the concepts we wish to explain because I think a phylogenetic historical kinds of kind of uh, refinement story can help us define what the right questions are to ask um, rather than asking the wrong questions for a hundred years. You know, I, I think the problem is with, with classical psychology is that it leads us to ask questions which may just turn out to not be good ones. Uh, and we can protect ourselves, I think, uh, by following something that is closer to um, the way the thing was, the, the end product was actually constructed. So I have two things to say to that. First, I think sometimes there is an echo. So if if uh, you know the if you had uh, if you have like had headphones handy, that would help. Or if the volume is a little lower, it might help. Secondly, since you are saying that you're, you're making this generalization that there are questions in psychology that are wrong or there are bad questions, uh, it seems like you are disregarding in your beautiful scholarly work. I wonder whether doing a little bit of scholarly work on the history of psychology might change your mind. <laughs> and it seems well, I like John is pleased by that. I actually have but, done a little bit. The reason I'm saying this, the is reason this I'm saying this, yes. The reason I'm saying this is that these concepts didn't just come out of nowhere, right? There yeah. were sort of, there, there is a kind of, a, let's say, phylogenetic argument to be made about these uh, concepts themselves. Like there was an evolution of these concepts in sort of experimental and theoretical work, right? I feel like 
so some of the issues, some of the one thing also maybe for the audience that you do acknowledge at the end of your paper is that you really do not address how attention, memory, uh, working memory, any of these concepts or higher order cognitive concepts, you don't uh, at all address how might your approach be applied to this. <coughs> you yeah, just well say that, hey, there is a problem with psychology without clarifying which specific sort of, um, it, it seems to me like there. If, if uh, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of including uh, more evolutionary understanding, I'm very sympathetic to including the sort of the development of the dorsal and ventral uh, sort of action and perception kind of mm -hmm. uh, interactions and how that might have been related to the to the to the evolution of thinking. There is even work in philosophy that uh, construes thinking as an extension of action, so it's internal actions and attention as internal perception, for instance. So there is like, there is this kind of ideas have been around. But that's, a, I feel like that's one argument, but the, the burden of proof is um, on doing a little more focused and sort of, I guess, careful work on specific approaches to attention, memory. Are you worried about some work or are you saying, let's throw the baby with the bath water entirely? That's the point where no. I'm not entirely clear. Yeah, so, so, um... I, I can't do it all. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I do um, apply this uh, more seriously to decision making because that is something I study. And so in the context of decision making, I do try to think about uh, how this addresses the different kinds of decision making that, that we've been studying for now. Um, and again, I work with monkeys, so their, their decision making is not as sophisticated as yours and mine. But um, so yes, I think it can be applied, but you know, I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm one guy. I, I've 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 got one a small lab. I, I can't answer I can't answer to the question of working memory. However, um, Amy Arston is um, I know she wrote a uh, grant with a number of people uh, um, looking at that, looking at that kind of thing across different species looking at, um, uh, you know, working memory. Um, other people are ad addressing different, different questions, and, and I think that's great. I think the more, the more people address things uh, with, with this additional sort of perspective, the better. And I don't think, and yes, I've read a lot of the history of psychology, um, um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that all the ideas should just be thrown out. Um, I think we should be very wary, though, of ideas that emerged before we knew better and stuck around simply because um, you know it, it was difficult to snap out of them. Uh, like like you know the idea of dualism. You know cognition was was proposed. You know. No, <laughs> the mind was rejected. The mind was rejected by behaviorists. Um, uh, too far, and cognition was brought in to replace that gap, to literally replacing the mind. I think uh, you know. I, I now, of course, it's not. It's not so. It, I'm not saying that it's. It's like you know. It's flawed and it should be completely thrown out. But I think that the the structure of the system uh, that we have, that original taxonomy, is actually based very much on traditions and ideas that we've actually rejected. Um, and that we can we can do without. And a lot of the more fundamental concepts for which there is experimental data can exist in the other taxonomy as well. And they can be sort of recontextualized in a, in a kind of way. Now, now again, I'm just saying this about the things that I don't study. So I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you much about language. Sorry, or, so sorry, uh, I'm not talking memory, about but... you studying them. I'm mentioning that in your paper, uh, where you're conceptually proposing a way forward, Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, and I didn't mean in terms of you having <clears throat> read psychology. I meant in your paper that the level of scholarly attention that is being paid to sort of uh, yeah. early parts of evolution is certainly not paid to show why those much simpler capacities. Uh, how does it sort of? Why is it that you argue that these sort of higher order cognitive capacities? cannot be sort of uh, studied without having all of the sort of lineage there. It's called- Actually, it's part called, of the answer- It's called reductionism in evolutionary disguise. And that's all it is. And uh, and I think that it's, 
you know, I but think that not. job has to be done. It is. It is. No, but the question, right. the question of the symbol, <laughs> let's talk, let's talk about symbol grounding, the problem of meaning. And you had a very nice session with Men Melanie Mitchell about this. Who is here in the audience and has a yes, question. Yes, I, I saw, and, and maybe she can uh, <laughs> chime in. So the symbol grounding problem started from the psychological end of things. So start with humans talking to each other about, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of white men sitting in leather chairs with pipes. Um, Probably they were black initially, though. Just oh, yeah? <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, you know, the traditional f philosophy of mind, you know, from that standpoint, um, the symbol and, 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 and the question of, the, of, of grounding. OK, so it's it's been it's been a problem, philosophical problem for uh, hundreds of a hundred years, at least identified. Um, and it is a high level problem. This is not a reductionist issue. This is a, a sort of a high level emergence type uh, issue. How do you attach meaning to the syntactic, purely syntactic operations uh, of, of these types of models? And I would say, okay, no, turn it around. And, and Giovanni Pizzullo has a nice paper on this. He calls it the symbol detachment problem. And he says, all right, suppose you think about interaction. And I could show you, okay, I could give you the slide, but I'll, I'll just describe it. Um, all right, so how can we address language and meaningful linguistic interactions from the context that I'm, that I'm proposing? And I'm saying the reason I, I focus so much on the early homeostatic stuff is because that's, I think, where the answer lies. And Gibson said this, lots of people said this. So you have behavior, you have sort of the control system that's within the body, that's physiology. You can control, you can extend that through the skin, through interaction, that's behavior. Well, you can extend that system through other creatures as well. Right, so if you're a helpless human baby, you can't fend for yourself, you can't get things, but it so happens that in your niche, there are these things called parents, and they're willing to do anything to bring you whatever it is that you need. And the thing that's really handy about parents is you can, you can uh, produce incredibly complicated results, you as the baby can produce incredibly complicated results with just a sim simple utterance. So you can provide them with a single cue, a very compact key stimulus, if you will, that's symbolic, and it just says, I'm hungry. And they will do whatever it takes, whether, whether it means getting out of the house at, at, the mid, at midnight and minus 30 below weather, driving to the store. They will provide for you. And, and that's meaningful interactions. Okay, maybe this is, maybe this is trivial, but this is the, the fundamental, um, this is the fundamental, um, sort of source of purpose and meaning it's it's that it actually it's gives the fundamental you particle i mean it's just it's just you, 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 you but it you, but it is but that's there's no question of meaning in that interaction right so there's the question of how does how do you turn that interaction into something that's symbolic and has the syntax that we humans have have done so so much with i think the point is that the meaning was never a problem it's the question now we can ask, and again, we can ask it in a more or less phylogenetic way, you know, at least until, until primate communication, is how do you get these kinds of utterances emerging in a, in a particular social group whereby animals can control each other and persuade each other through these very symbolic utterances, you know, back off. Is a symbolic uh, is a symbolic utterance. Right? Interesting and choice of I'm an doing. example. On on that note, I think that uh, we should hear from Jovo, and also we have a lot of great questions from former guests of the salon, and also new folks who are here. So I really want to. So, so, so Ida, can I can I ask? I just there's this one thing I wanted to he say. Was you, I've, not, oh, I've heard you twice now, Paul, talk about eighty percent of psychological terms. Now, I actually got hold of the source. What it really yeah, was yeah. is Russell, uh -oh. Pol Russell Poldrack actually showed that 22.9% of all cognitive atlas mental concepts are used at least once in Henry James's 1890 uh -oh. principle of psychology. So stop saying 80%, it's 20 <laughs> 80% was single words. 80% oh, okay. was single so, terms. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so yeah. no, but you, it's concepts, okay? And it's 23%. So please, yeah, so what we, in other words, yeah. no, no, but what we've been doing is we've taken the concepts and then we qualify them with subdividing them. So we take memory and we subdivide it into different kinds of memory. Joe, and, what and, do you want to? And I'm, what I'm saying is that that gives us that taxonomy. And I think we, I, I think we can do better than that. Um, so, with, with some, you know, neuroscience. I have a 
question related to, to that thing that, that John just said. And so I think, you know, uh, I'm less of a hater um, on the, on some of the stuff that Paul is saying than John is, I think. Uh, we, we all agree, obviously, there's lots of beautiful parts of it. Um, my perspective is kind of the following. In a sense, there's like a, a Lamarckian taxonomy of cognition, and that's what is arguably the most widespread, and that's what figure one of the slides, and I forgot figure one of the paper, shows this taxonomy. And then I think Paul is putting forth arguably a more Darwinian taxonomy, um, where it's not the phenomenology that's kind of the implicit metric of what counts as being close to one another, but rather the implicit metric is something like the genetic or the evolutionary history of these concepts. And you know, to me, that's, it's a very interesting, different metric. Now, there's no one right metric. There's no one right taxonomy of these concepts. All of these concepts are highly multidimensional. And you can choose you know, any metric you want and any dimension you want, and you can, you can develop a taxonomy, and they can be very explanatory. You know, I defer to Lamarckian taxonomy of animals all the time accidentally, because I just forget that, like, whatever, tomatoes aren't vegetables or, you know, just things like that. They're helpful, mm -hmm. even if they're not doing everything that we want them to do. So my question is not actually to Paul. My question is to John, and um, I also, I would like to hear, I think Iris is here, I saw her earlier. I, I'm really curious about her perspective. because She wrote something very interesting recently about um, cognitive concepts and about how there's a lot of investment now in reproducibility um, of the neural measurements, and maybe we should go back and try to understand a formal theory of cognition prior to investing so much in the reproducibility which is, I think, very closely related to Paul's motivation, which is that these concepts maybe aren't doing what we want them to do, and we should rethink them. So the question is, what metric do you want us to use to build a taxonomy of cognitive concepts? Paul is saying the one we've used is old and out of date, and we should have a new one, and he's advocating for one, and it has problems, as you pointed out, and I think Paul acknowledges that they're problems, Nonetheless, it is a procedure that one could use to try to infer what are the cognitive concepts we want. And so I'm saying to you, okay, you don't like that one, which one should we use instead? And I, I'm gonna invite Iris also, hopefully she's willing to join. To be clear, Paul still uses cognitive maps, working memory, attention, decision. He's still using those, so. Well, mostly because I, I want you to understand what I'm talking about and it's close enough. The words are close enough. That I haven't I seen the alternative point. suggestions though. I haven't seen the alternative suggestions. It's a fair point. I think Paul, if I Well, the cognitive map that started out was very pragmatic, right? It was it was sort of, you know, what I, what I was talking about at first, that first animal where everything in the medial pallium is all, re, all context dependent. It's not really that much of a cognitive map per se. I'm not sure, you know, cognitive science would, would, would allow that in this description. So it wasn't that cognitive at first, and then maybe, you know, I just think the word, the word cognitive carries a lot of um, difficult baggage. So, I mean, I, mean, I would I mean, like to see a better terminology. I mean, but the thing is, what I find so frustrating about this is that every discipline has to update its concepts and its methods, yeah. whether it's yeah. economics, sociology, and the idea that the best way to be rigorous and to update our concepts is looking at the evolution of a worm sensory motor system is as riddled with assumptions and problems as any other way of being rigorous. And so what you have to do is be a pluralist and say that you can do good experiments in humans, you can do good experiments in primates, and you can begin to revise your conceptual frameworks and your vocabulary equally well scientifically at every level of analysis. And the idea that looking at the evolution of prey capture is, is the best way to revise one's concepts is just on the face of it to me. Well, if, if, if you come up, but if you come up with something which is fundamentally doesn't match up with the organization of the nervous system, well, then I don't think it's that good. Well, and well, I think, you, but Paul, I you think, can... and of course, everybody tries to match it up with the with the fundamental architecture of the nervous system. But I'm saying, let's get that architecture, um, you know, informed as many ways as we can. And because it was actually created by a particular process uh, with that hundreds of people are studying with very advanced methods and the methods are only getting more advanced. 
I'm saying, well, let's include that in our pluralism, but but not just as well, you know, uh, it's you know, it's another way of looking at it. Let's let's consider it a you know almost like a a requirement to to have a if you propose a theory. I would ask you to tell me, you know, first of all, what the data that supports it is. But also, words, just, I would just, ask you to, what's the evolutionary so, story? So just to understand, so if somebody comes up with a um, a learning rule, like temporal difference learning, or, or and they show some neural correlate of it, or they show in either or experiments that one learning rule or another, you say, stop, don't do that kind no. of work until you've shown the evolutionary neuroanatomy of that process. And no, but with two spread. different theories, but two different theories, one that has the story, one that doesn't, I'll prefer the one that yeah, does. And also and, Ida, Ida challenged you, and I yeah. agree with her, that you never really, and I, and I can see it in the chat, you never gave us a killer demonstration of how your evolutionary story has added any clarity to a cognitive theory that we have. We do, I didn't see it in the paper. Uh, and neither did either. So where did we get an either or killer argument about a cognitive well, can, can I interrupt I, you? Ew, ew, it was 20 I don't minutes. think, John, you didn't answer my question. You just yelled more at Paul. <laughs> what, what should we do instead? He's saying a concrete thing. We're saying yeah. do what we do what Ida does and do what Paul does. Everyone does rigorous work at every mm. level where they're operating at. Okay, but but the approach of classic cognitive science has had a long time, and it still is not giving us pieces that match neuro neurophysiological data. And so I think that okay, we could spend another seventy years with the classical uh, computational compositional uh, theory of mind. Or we could try something else, which actually hasn't been tried uh, for the most part. Uh, and what I'm saying is that what you're suggesting is that there's no problem. And I'm suggesting that actually is a problem. And here is something that we've been ignoring. And maybe that's part of the problem. We've been ignoring a, a, an incredibly valuable source of insights because we all believe that it's the source of the organization. And, you know, and I think there are, and, and if you want some more concrete examples, I, you know, of, of things that, um, that this might explain, uh, you know, I think in the decision-making field, um, there are ideas about, you know, the decision-making system, which uh, are based very much on, you know, neuroeconomics or whatever. Uh, and they don't really explain, for example, why certain kinds of things are involve the basal ganglia, other things don't. There's this question about, is basal ganglia part of the decision-making system? Is it not part of the decision-making system? And my answer to that is, if you follow through sort of an evolutionary story, then you can see which kinds of uh, decision-making basal ganglia is involved in and which kinds it isn't. And then you can design experiments to test those. And I think that's an example where I have more concrete ideas. I don't have a lot of data on this yet, but I can at least you know, I can at least sketch out a plan of action for the next, you know, 10, 15 years of an experimental approach that is informed by by, by those kinds of ideas. It, it's not just that it's got to be decision making or not decision making, because that's how we've defined our taxonomy. No, basal ganglia might be choosing between the different, I'll give you, I'll give you the sketch that we've proposed is the basal ganglia might be switching between the types of behavioral uh, the aspect of your behavioral repertoire that you might want to release at a given time. So do you want to sit at this at this bush and pick berries or do you want to go to another bush? That kind of high level decision is more basal ganglia like, uh, probably hypothalamus like as well. Whereas the which berry you pick might be more the particular part of the uh, frontoparietal cortex that the basal ganglia invigorates when you're decided to sit and pick berries. And that has the right kind of spatial map of, of reachable space that you need to make decisions about but, 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 Just okay. to finish for so, me, the, the, the invigoration argument, which we made and others made, like Yael yeah, Niv, came from psychology, not from animals. Sure. All right, so but it's sorry, very nicely sorry, sorry. We need to, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Like, there's a lot of wonderful questions that I want to make sure we have time to get through them. Melanie, we're so happy to have you here again. Hi, go ahead. Hi. Hi, uh, thanks, Paul. This is, was a great talk, really interesting discussion. I really um, enjoyed yours, by the way. I just wanted to you. throw that thank in. Thank you. Yeah. So my question is, so you, 
when you go through the the sort of history of, of evolution of nervous system, how do you avoid like interp the interpretation problems in evolution? You know, Gould talked a lot about yeah. sort of the idea of functional adaptations yeah. and spandrels. And now we have, you know, a lot of claims in evolutionary psychology literature about kind of stories about functions in the brain. Yeah. You, you have this idea that you want to ground all these new concepts in, in terms of evolutionary constraints, but then you might run into these problems of these so just so stories. So I just yeah, want to hear yeah. that. Yeah, so the, I think the way to avoid them is to, is to um, not start with the why something happened, a question. You know, there's, there's this tradition of this evolutionary psychology is, is not what I'm proposing. Evolution psychology says, why should there be this particular capacity? Well, that's because it makes the social group better or something. I think if you start at that end, you're, you're, you have a lot of pitfalls. You could get it right, but there's a lot of pitfalls you could make because lots of things can happen for lots of reasons and there's lots of ways to, to, to get at one thing. Um, I think the, easy, the safer way to proceed is the... So that's kind of like the natural selection aspect. What's the selective advantage of this thing? What I would say is take the other pillar of evolution, descent with modification, and say what actually did happen without necessarily asking why. What system, how did the system actually elaborate through a particular transition in evolution, which we can, which we can discover? Um, and and on, only after you have that can you then, um, th then you have a sort of a, a more solid base to, to make the more speculative thing which is to, to ascribe functional advances to it. Now, the, and the person I think that, that does this really well is, is Puelas. So Puelas is a, is a developmental neuroscientist whose work I'm very strongly influenced by. And he's looking at the developmental process. How does it change us, right? And he avoids the, the, the speculation by just not engaging in it. So he says, don't talk about function. Let's just lay down what the system, how the system changed. And so he and his colleagues are doing all of that very carefully, and they're giving us sort of the roadmap to which we, you know, closet philosophers like me, can add, uh, you know, functional stories. And and then it's not, uh, it's you know, it's still going to be a hypothesis, right? So you know, I, I I would claim that what I'm suggesting is not just so stories like you know like like the criticism that is made of evolutionary psychology. I, I'm saying they're hypotheses and they need to be tested, but we can test them because they do make predictions. They do make predictions about how, um, you know, how the system will be organized beyond uh, perhaps what, what you uh, started with. Uh, I can give some more concrete examples, but, but I don't want to go too much on a tangent. But anyway, the point is I think to do it is to, to stay closer to the more solid data. So what I've done is essentially I've let myself be led by people whose methods to me seem really sound and really solid, like Puelas, like Stan Grillner, like, like a lot of the people that do the, um, a lot of those names on the side of my talks, uh, on the side of my slides, th those people's work. Um, I, I would, I mean, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this, but I, I would be interested in hearing some concrete examples of this approach, because I'm not totally convinced that it's that different. Um, <laughs> You know, when you're making up functional stories about something. Well, how, the, how, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a quick one. I'll give you a quick one. The idea proposed by Hills and others that the early role of dopamine was to uh, arbitrate between sticking around versus going somewhere else. These are fundamentally different behaviors and, and perhaps should deserve their own system. If that's true, and if that's been retained and con continues to control uh, the behavior of mammals, then you would expect a different distribution of dopamine receptors in the medial versus ventrolateral portions of the of the telencephalon. And that is actually true. You have more D2 receptors in the septum, which is sort of part of the explore, what I would call the explore circuit with the hippocampus. Uh, and you have more D1 receptors in the piriform cortex, which is more of the exploit ingest system. And so it's like saying the tonic dopamine is going to favor, high levels of tonic dopamine are going to favor one aspect of behavior over another. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, that's a prediction and turned out to be, to, to be correct. I was very happy to see that. But, you know, I, I mean, that's, that's just scratching the surface. I mean, I think you could make much better. I, I would like to do some experiments with neural recording, you know, uh, frankly, I think it would be, it'd be nice to design experiments that way. And, um, 
I will Great. do that at some point. Thank you. Thank you. To bring up someone else for a question. Uh, you're muted, Jovo. You're muted. Thanks, Melanie. Feel free to stay on. I just invited John yeah. Lankford to join. I think he's a complimentary AI kind of perspective that um, curious to hear how you would respond to whatever he says as well. <coughs> Hello. Hi, John. Hi. Hey, Welcome. Uh, so I guess I was kind of curious about the constraints that evolution imposes. So it, it plausibly imposes constraints in terms of the ordering of functionalities. But I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is, does it compose? Does it impose any constraints on, on what functionalities are possible? In the sense that if you have a mind of some sort, or a brain, or a neural system, or whatever, is there something that it cannot uh, evolve to achieve eventually? Um, well, the the variations that enter into natural selections have to be possible. So it does constrain what sure. kind of next step, what the next step will be. It does constrain that a lot, yeah. but that doesn't mean that all av that some avenues are forever closed. Um, however, I, 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 I believe there probably are a few cases where certain avenues get closed. Um, I think the exoskeleton of insects has prevented uh, them from achieving the kinds of sizes that you get with, um, with vertebrates. So you never have dinosaur size um, beetles, thank goodness. Um, so I, I think certain certain things have been closed to certain kinds of animals for those reasons. I don't know neurally whether there's such whether there's such constraints that really close things, but I do think it makes certain adaptations more or less likely. And and I think probably the the path that uh, sauropsids took, the diurnal path, uh, with strong reliance on the optic tectum, gave them a certain architecture that we don't have because we passed through this nocturnal stage and only much later uh, came back to the diurnal vision-based life uh, with a small superior colliculus, which is, which is our tectum. And so I, I think there's probably, there's probably design um, repercussions that happen. Of course, crows can still use tools and we can use tools. And so, I mean, you know, I, I don't think paths are necessarily closed. I think maybe mechanisms are going to be so, so strongly constrained that um, you know, um, in in the end, I mean, I think we'll get it. We, we can only really know if we study the sp specific transitions that that each lineage has passed. Um, do we know so what? So I'm coming at this is it sort of the design approach to creating intelligence, and the sort of the <laughs> evolution approach to creating intelligence. And you know, in theory, the design approach could do things that the evolution approach could never do. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we see this in like actual computers in terms of like memory, computers are really good at memory, uh, yeah. better than humans are. Um, but that just seems to be mostly just a, a question of the substrate that, that you're operating on. And so well, I guess, no, I think it has to do, I, I think if you have two, these two different approaches using the same hardware. Is there really any extra power from the design approach over the evolutionary approach? Uh, I, I think actually, so everything I've said is not really that relevant for AI, I think, mm -hmm. because if AI can do, accomplish something, then who cares? You don't have to, you don't, you guys don't have, you know, I don't know if you're an AI guy, but anyway, I don't think AI people need to read evolution. I think it's more the neuroscientists that need to, they need to be, you know, not maybe read all of it, but at least be, a, be, a, be sensitive to it. I actually um, disagree And I think in many cases, I think in many cases you, you can just, bypass it. But I think given the fact that that the only uh, example of an intelligent system we have is humans and that the artificial approach hasn't solved some of its problems yet and therefore might want to look at humans, then, you know, then in that sense, it's, it's indirectly valuable to, to, mm -hmm. to look at these things. But I don't think, I mean, if you can come up for a solution for, you know, for memory in a computer, that's, that's great. Uh, and there's no, there's no, uh, there's no need to go through the torturous story of vertebrate like lineage, you know. I think that was a really funny uh, comment, Paul, just for situational awareness. Yeah. John is, is one of the most important AI people, I think, in the world. Oh. He's done a lot on, <laughs> on memory and efficient memory coding and storage, uh, right. retrieval and, and lots of other things. So, uh, um, so I've, I've um, sorry, I've uh, revealed my ignorance. <laughs> it's okay. Which I is embarrassing because I was a computer AI type guy. <laughs> 
Well, actually, <laughs> Paul used to be at Microsoft, John. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was briefly, yeah. And I gave it all up. <laughs> can, I, can I make a quick comment? Um, so I, I think that it, it, your, your view of evolution is, is purely biological, but a big part of <laughs> our evolution is cultural. Yes. Absolutely. Social at the level of social groups and so on. And that hugely enlarges the space of what our cognition can do. You know, yes, our cognition is social, our cognition is scaffolded on external things like computers, for example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So why draw this boundary? Well, mostly it's, it's the engineering versus the science boundary. It's like if you're interested in building artificial systems and you can do it, uh, great. Um, I'm not saying that there must be an inherent reason why you couldn't uh, solve engineering problems uh, without thinking about evolution. Well, well, no, um, I'm, but I'm the, not... but the question of the question of the question of uh, uh, cultural though, I I do think that's actually really important, and and this is the again the interaction aspect of behavior, that that uh, the, again like the, the the parent providing the child with what the child needs. The parent doesn't just do that. The the parent also gradually teaches the child which symbols to utter in which context to get which outcomes and gradually and each generation is teaching its children a more and more sophisticated scaffolding of of these these interactions these abstract interactions that uh you know exploded right it exploded um in in humans uh in human societies our brains are not that different than they were uh you know 200,000 years ago, and yet our societies have gone so far. And I think it's it's part because because of this cultural um, scaffolding, what, what people call it. Uh, and, you know, the idea that you sort of internalize the logic of your interaction with others it, within yourself and that sort of thinking to yourself. I mean, you know, I, I don't know that literature that well, but I think it sounds pretty reasonable and, and certainly not incompatible with anything I've said. Because there is this big to... question. I think yeah, this sorry. relates to the way that John phrased his question in the ask a question where he's asking, is there a good example of an important capability which is plausibly neurally implementable but not observed to be neurally evolved? And I think a lot of the things that you said, there is not a clear way in which some of the cultural human and capacities or communication capacities have evolved necessarily. But it, the same brain over the past uh, 200,000 years has been capable of this kind of um, implementation, which I think you cite Block 1995 uh, virtual machine idea yeah. in your paper yeah. in reference to this idea that there is a point perhaps in evolution where this virtual mach machine is, is um, possible on top of some architecture that's flexible enough. And yeah. humans seem to be able to go places where it's not necessarily evolutionarily uh, traceable, but it is contingent upon the same neural implementation. Yeah, but I think if we want to understand the neural implementation, then we want to sort of have that grounding from from the biology and the evolution of that biology. But I do think so. Yeah, so this is a challenge for any theory, right? How can any theory of the neuroscience of human behavior explain the fact that a similar brain is doing such different things now? Um, but I do think that we get some clues, you know, if, if we, again, if we have that baseline, so if, if we actually were to have a baseline theory of primate brain, then that would give us a, a sort of good launching point for those, that theory that tries to connect and say, how could this thing have exploded to such a degree? And, and there's, there's this idea, and this actually, this, this idea is actually relevant to the origins of life too, that life uh the sort of autocatalytic sets emerge essentially as as an explosion once the complexity of the chemical environment gets high enough right and so there's this idea that uh similar um you know explosion of of interactive and abstraction uh, appear as soon as you have a, a certain achieved a certain level of interaction between individuals through symbolic and through language. I, I, I really think language is a big part of it and social structure is a big part of it. Um, and I think, you know, I think those are promising ways of thinking, but I, I, I don't know that stuff. I, I, that's not my specialty. Um, I do think though that, that we could get at it um, from both ends, you know, sort of have a, a baseline model of, of primate brain um, that does some of these things. I, you know, Carl Friston would say it's all predictive. Uh, it's it's all predictive processing, and and you know, you know, I, I think you know, yes, I think that's a big part of it. Um, we can predict consequences 
far ahead into the future, very abstract things. Um, and, and, you know, and in the end, you know, the funny thing about all this is that I started out so much like anti fodor and, and, you know, language of thought. But the funny thing is that this could actually bring that back. I mean, if you, if you, if you think about internalizing the logic of language, which Piaget and many others have said, um, underlying thought in the end, it could be a little bit like that kind of, you know, you know, machine for abstract, you know, logic sitting on top of a sensory motor brain. What we know yeah. from Stan DeHaan's work that, for which yeah. he won the Rommelhardt Prize at the Cognitive Science uh, Conference in 2020 this year, um, there is no universal language of thought in the brain. And it seems like there is language like processing of geometric shape in different parts of the brain mm -hmm. than the language area. So it could be that there's different parts of the bra human brain that are capable of doing that. And it might not as much rely on the evolutionary history of those particular parts of the brain. Um, uh, I just want to mention that your response to John makes me realize that what you were saying is that um, certain human cognitive <clears throat> functions that have psychological names could potentially be achieved with AI without looking at the phylogenetic history. That's what I understood from what you said. Yeah, but, but see, the reason why I left AI is because I didn't see how to do it, right? There were all these problems that AI had... Um, come against that I thought were insurmountable. And I thought, well, you know, let's, let's see what neuroscience can tell us. And then I just kind of, you know, got into neuroscience, got excited about neuroscience. Um, I, I think it's hard to solve some of those problems. And again, part of the problem I think is we have is that we define problems and then we seek to solve them. But what if we didn't define it correctly? You know, what, what if we, you know, some of our basic fundamental sort of assumptions are just wrong. It's very likely that they are, right? And what I'm saying is maybe we should have a way of, um, you know, reconsidering and redefining them and trying to think about, you know, is it is there really a cognitive system that we want to understand, you know? Um, because maybe maybe there isn't. Maybe it's a number of capacities that we need to break, carve up very differently before we're asking the right questions. So and related, I, I think we need a strategy for doing that. Related to this, uh, I want to say that I generally find the area of AI and machine learning in these areas under constrained. And so finding yeah. good constraints yeah. is actually extremely valuable for shaping research directions. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is where the control metaphor is actually useful. You know, the idea that the brain is not an input output system. It's not produce response to a given stimulus. It's produce the response that results in the right stimulus, right? It's a control system. It's a special case of a information or of, of some kind of an, you know, uh, input output system, but it's a spe special case which therefore limits the sort of the space of possibilities that, that one needs to explore. And so I think, you know, anything that helps us constrain the space of all possible theories is, is helpful, you know. And again, the evolutionary, uh, the constraint of evolution can eliminate certain classes of theories, I think, very readily. And then we don't have to pursue those uh, maybe, you know, again, if it's, if it's incompatible with evolution, well, then I, I wouldn't pursue it, you know, yeah. or, or try to find a way that it could the be. The question here is, do you lose something by doing that, right? And I don't see something that you lose yet. Well, um, you could be wrong about the evolution part. That's why you have to do that. You have to, you know, that, that part does have to be very data, you know, uh, not maybe data driven, but respecting the data at every step. You, you always have to, you know, refine the story uh, as much as you can. Um, and and you know again what we you know to tell you the truth what we really need is few more people studying uh, different species because right now we don't we don't we need some people studying we need more people recording in sharks and reptiles and you know most species of monkeys because only then will we really be able to do this right but that's a that's a whole other can of worms that's yeah. hard to do thank you. Speaking of evolution, I think we don't have nearly enough atoms on the stage right now. And so I'd like to invite some here. Um, there's a few. Adam, Adam Charles, Adam Kepek. Oh, oh, okay, I have to kick off somebody first. This, this thing doesn't let us do that. I wish I could kick myself off. You guys could talk. What's you our want, policy? Do you want me we to have First in, first out. Is that our, is that our policy? 
Molly, can you stand by? We can maybe bring you back later. Sure. Okay, great. See you, Melanie. Okay, Adam Charles, let's hope that his microphone works this time. We shall see very soon. Yeah. I hope Adam Kepik is still online also. Well, at least we'll have one working mic for an Adam. There he is. Hi, Adam. Hey, can you oh, hear you me? Oh, you have ah. a voice. Yes. <laughs> wow. Wow. I've evolved <laughs> since last time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well done. That um, was nice bad. one. That was, that was good. <laughs> Look, you know, I mean, uh, it's, I got to do something to pass the time. Uh, <laughs> So I, I I wanted to follow a, a thread that was going on from the recent, um, it actually leads in from some of the recent discussions perfectly in terms of how far do we need to take this idea of our definitions being right or wrong? And, you know, I wanted to go with the, 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 the issue of not, you know, not are you going far enough? or not are you going too far, but are you going far enough in terms of redefinition of taxonomy? Um, the conversation keeps going back to area X is responsible in thing Y. And that implies and requires a division of tasks and perception into some type of Cla you know, class of Y, right? A set of Y that we need to assign to areas X and furthermore divides the brain into areas X that we then, you know, look for an evolution, right? Area visual cortex has evolved in this way or hippocampus has evolved in this way. And how much is that holding us back in terms of, you know, should we just be considering the evolutionary tr uh, train, so to speak, as an evolution of the tasks that are required and the hardware, so to speak, that is available rather than the function that is being performed. Yeah, I, I, think, I think what you just said, yeah, I think what you just said, we should think about how did the um, modifications at the sort of neuroanatomical circuit level uh, confer, um, you know, task, sort of, sort of, uh, allow an animal to um, to do something it wasn't able to do before. Uh, for example, um, the, you know, something happened at early vertebrates where the genome was duplicated. Um, and that allowed uh, the midbrain to split into multiple uh, sectors, multiple neuromeres. And that now allows those two different neuromeres to specialize. So one becomes the pretectum, one becomes the tectum. And this way you can retain old functions while uh, modifying and, and developing new ones. And, and um, you know, the same can be true for the divisions of the pallium, which in lamprey, there's really two clear divisions. Uh, there's gradients within the ventral lateral pallium. But then once you get to amniotes, you very clearly have four subdivisions that now specialize in different ways. One of them becomes the insula, one of them becomes piriform cortex, one becomes hippocampus, and one becomes neocortex. And, and the history of how those things separated from each other uh, is, is that I think there's a discoverable history of what uh, that conferred to the animals as they um, as they went down that path. In other words, I think you can, um, you know, in, in the end, it's not gonna be area X, area Y. Uh, it's not gonna be that uh, area X function Y. Uh, but I, I think it might, might be circuit X uh, behavioral context Y, but, but, you know, I wouldn't maybe even go that far. Uh, I think it's going to be, uh, it's difficult for us to, I think, map it to the familiar functions that we're thinking of now. Um, I, I do like the idea of the sort of um, behavioral based, and this is something very similar to, you know, what roboticists have done, a kind of a behavior based uh, subdivision. Um, you know, again, a fundamental distinction for any mobile animal is do you want to stay put or do you want to go somewhere else? 
And you really should have a specialized system for doing all the things required with staying local because you need different sensory information. You're going to do different things. Whereas the go somewhere else system really should become different. It should have different strategies and, and it should then become something with, with a different structure. And, you know, there may be similarities again, because they inherited, they specialized out of the same telencephalic system but one is going to go one way and the other just because they're really specialized in doing different things. I, so I think you can reconstruct that and, and then you have a better answer to your X and Y question. It's not exactly function X maybe, but maybe. So how, how much can we expect that the same circuit is responsible in the same behavioral context, even if we go that far over the course of evolution or, you know, the same way that we see plasticity in brains, you know, post stroke or, you know, mm -hmm. after other kind of um, traumatic events in individuals, that that might play a part in the evolutionary role of terms of, you know, a circuit might have been evolved for one thing for the first half of, you know, the many epochs of yeah, evolution, yeah, yeah. but gets overtaken. Oh, yeah. and you know, that happens. What is that? Oh, yeah. What is that smoothness? Oh, that happens. That happens. I mean, things things lose function. You know, the olfactory projections to the telencephalon withdrew in mammals in many places, and and created and other things created. You know, new circuits uh, do emerge, and and yeah, I think that's a big deal. You know, the mammals, for example, have much more telencephalic control of their movement than non-mammals. Birds also do, um, and yeah, these things happen, and I and I think we can understand them. Uh, I think it's better to understand them from, again, from a, some the perspective of a phylogenetic progression because it, it makes it at least makes some sense. Um, but um, but yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's why I think a historical story is, is necessary. It, it's a historical story is necessary because the the function for that that a particular system is doing for a diurnal tree dwelling primate, um, that same system in a fish. Was doing something different. I mean, there's a whole, there's a sequence of how it got there um, that uh, you know only really makes sense once you once you follow through the sequence. Um, so, but I do think you you want to map. Yeah, obviously, I want to map function to structure all along the way. Of course, there's lots of challenges, right? I mean, you know, we don't yeah. we we don't have some species. <laughs> we don't we don't know what they were doing, you know. For all we know, there was well, I mean, for you know, one of the big things is you need, um, you know, some kind of uncertainty estimate when you're trying to infer what the yeah. right. We know the species that what they're doing now, right? We have the biology, we have the physiology only of what's existing now, and yeah. we can trace genetically, you know, what the tree looks like. Yeah. But that requires a significant portion of inference as to what the function was at each node of the tree going backwards. Yeah, and I don't. You know what is the what is the uncertainty propagation there look like? <laughs> um, well, it's it, yeah, it's it's daunting. I can tell you that it's daunting. The the best way to get at it is to study as many species as possible, so you get an, a, the best idea as possible about common ancestors. What was special? Like for example, one thing which I find amazing is lamprey have something like somatosensory uh, regions and uh, retinotopy in the part of their brain that's homologous to our neocortex. But intervening animals, at least today, this is Grillner has shown this actually in the last couple of years. It's quite a shockwave to everybody because it hasn't been seen in amphibians or fish or even reptiles. You know, you don't see that. And, and it has projections to the, to, to downstream centers, like what, you know, like the, you know, uh, uh, hindbrain. And, and is it because lamprey came up with it on their own? Or is it just an ancestral thing that we just haven't found in because we haven't been studying enough of the other animals? And I think the question is, well, we don't know. We, we just don't know. We have to study those other animals before we can answer that question. Um, and until then, it's, it's a source of uncertainty. And there's plenty of these, I'll admit. There's plenty of these uncertainties. But, you know, they, they, they sort of gradually um, diminish as you study more and read more you know so if you go from both ends if you see the 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 state of a you know the the, the mammalian the sort of basic mammalian um uh, system to to the extent that we can infer it it tells you a little bit about the early amniote and the early tetrapod etc but you want you also want to compare it to birds this is why the method kind of the method kind of loses it when you get to one species like humans because now you don't, we don't have Neanderthals. We don't have, you know, uh, the, um, 
Davids, Davisonians, or I forget, Denisovians. Um, we, we don't have those species. And, and so we have to, now we're, we're, that's as far as we can go with this method. Development still tells us a lot. Um, so development tells us a little bit. Fossils tell us a little bit, but um, it's, it's, not as, it's not as powerful as having the comparative method. Um, so yeah, there's, there's propagation of, of uncertainty. But the one thing which I find very um, encouraging is that um, the studies, that, at least that I've been reading, are all using techniques that are just exploding in um, efficiency and power and insight, like especially fate maps. The developmental um, studies are, are, are just, I think, taking off in very promising ways. So, um, you know, you can, you can now redefine the segmentation of, of vertebrate brains very confidently, I think. Um, now, I just read this stuff, so I just believe... I just believe what I read. <laughs> so, you know, if if Puelas is wrong, then I'm screwed. Then I my my a lot of my story is going to be wrong. You know, if Grillner's wrong, then I'm in big trouble. Too. So, <laughs> awesome, thanks. So, it, 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 a lot of it depends on this kind of work, and I, I and I would I wish there was more of it. Actually, mm -hmm. I wish there was more comparative systems neuroscience. Who, who's coming in next? Adam Kapich. Adam Kapich. Okay, uh, John, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Right. I know you have some time constraints. So we'll talk to you again soon. Right. Yeah, John is going to be our guest soon. So, uh, is Adam Kefich here? I'm going to have to read this chat thing. This is like he hasn't chat. responded in a little bit. So, I think that. He's accepting. He's, He's accepting. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just I'll give a brief introduction to to Adam just while we're waiting. Adam is a uh, he's a good friend. He's also a great neuroscientist. He's done a lot of really important behavioral work on um, as a computational neuroscientist and experimental neuroscientist. And Which Adam? Has, I guess both <laughs> Adams. Yeah. Well, well, Kapesh has a lot more experimental. I don't know. I've never done experiments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't let me in with the experimentals. <laughs> hey, Adam. Hi, Adam. Hi, Paul. This is awesome. Thanks for uh, thanks for this salon. Thanks for Paul. Thanks for joining. Really, really, what a what a great uh, opportunity to really discuss things. I so I mean, I should. Can I start my question or? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. So. So first, I'm a huge fan, and and I, I really think that evolution provides really fundamental constraints for for everything essentially. So it's hard to argue against that, and and, and it's it's also an important set of inspirations. So for, from all sorts of things, and and the flip side is of course that a behavior first approach like psychology, you know, clearly needs additional constraints. Um, but I'm really bothered by one thing, which is that when you draw these trees in these evolutionarily derived taxonomy, the labels you put on are still words, often psychological yeah, terms. Sure. Yeah. You mean in the boxes? The, the boxes. The boxes. And, and, yeah. and, and so this is a huge issue. I think it's, it's sort of hard to overstate the importance of this, to, to me at least, because how can you discover kind of a, a new organizational scheme uh, for behavior that doesn't match the current labels. And so, so let, let's be explicit about a few of these. Um, so exploit, explore, right? Really yeah. fundamental, sort of there from bacteria, right? Like to humans. Um, bacteria but it's the, it's the, sorry, it's the spatial exploit, explore. This is not exploit information, you know, versus explore new sources. Okay, so now you're starting to have nuance, and I'm, I'm yeah. sure, I know yeah. you know the nuance, I don't, but... Yeah. but <laughs> But but sort of we also have working memory, we you know, and, and perceptual decisions. Pre presumably bacteria, you know, in as much as sensing a gradient and drawing a line between, you know, this is high, this is low, and I'm gonna, you know, you could say that's a perceptual decision, right? So, so at, at least in certain ways of putting it. So, to, to what degree are we still really reliant on these existing concepts? I think this goes back to John, sort of the original uh, well, questions about yeah. this. I, 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 I actually, I love the approach. So I, I love the idea. I think we need these refreshing ideas. Um, but I'd really like to understand sort of how are we gonna cash in on this? Well, um, it, when, you, when you say to what extent, I would say less. It's less reliant on those definitions. And, and the method helps you 
uh, identify when your definition just wasn't that good, right? So I think the the idea of animals, um, you know, staying put versus going somewhere else, that's fundamentally the thing you want to talk about. And you can start talking about within the context of a dynamical system that doesn't have a strict distinction between these things. It just, let's say, has a levy walk, which is a kind of a distribution of movement uh, movement sizes, uh, and then just have a single variable that just modulates how much long long movements you make versus how many slow movements you make. And so now you have just a, a sort of a, a not, not, it's not a distinction really. Um, and early animals, I think, get by with something more, you know, sort of an analog modulation of behavior. Um, but I think at some point, and again, I think it's actually empirically discoverable if you study the right species in the right way, um, to, to find where it actually, in which animals you can actually say that this is a, now it's it's becoming specialized for dealing with the local versus the more long range behavior. So, and now, and now, you know, I would apply a label. I would call this exploit and explore, but they're not like platonic solids that these animals discovered. It's something that emerges out of the very sort of basic facts of life that some things you need to go somewhere else for and some things are near you, you know? And, and so I think that the definitions, if you go from that, if you go from that end, are less, um, there's fewer pitfalls than if you go, if you just make the definition and then search for the thing in the brain. So yes, you still have this problem, but it's a lot less of a problem than it is if you say, uh, this is attention and I will devote the rest of my life to studying the thing that's inside and not and ignore the stuff that's outside because that's different, right? Now, you know, Nobody really does that, but you know. well, I mean, attention is particularly problematic, right? You didn't have to, right? You know, I I love the William James. Everyone knows what attention is, right? So yeah. you're done, right? Like, like, like clearly, attention. You don't even need to invoke evolution to know that that's that that's sort of a, a troubled. Um, People gave him a hard time about that right away, apparently. Oh, I, well, right away he was criticized. For that. scientists still love it as their first quote. Yeah. So, so it, it feels to me. I mean, your day job is a neuroscientist, right? Yeah. So, so isn't isn't it what isn't what you're saying really what we're kind of doing, and 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 that's sort of like, and then there's a species issue. Sure, I'd love to record in more species, and I'm you know I'm part of the mouse rodent hegemony, you know, sort of, of because of tools, not not because yeah. I care about yeah. the particular critters, but because of the tools that enable us to to sort yeah. of the questions they enable us to to answer. So. It, it feels to me that you could apply to study the basal ganglia, the hippocampus, neocortex from an evolutionary perspective. Yeah. So apply the insights, but it's sort of a soft thing. It's it's sort of a background, but still study well, after the brain. So so meaning, I, I feel like the brain is still first, and and you, sure, I just haven't seen any of these evolutionary ideas to create distinctions. Um that carry that, that that allow me to say no 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 i, I shouldn't be doing this uh, well i'd like to i'd like to do that and i can tell you my my viewpoint is changing you know i started in this field i've always thought evolution is a good uh, source of insights but i'd never really read all of this you know i've been doing this for about four years and in that time i've i've revised a lot of ideas that i i had that I was comfortable with and and I've and I've rejected some of them and and took on different ones you know um I used to be a big skeptic for example of of Graziano's ideas now I think and and because they were incompatible with mine now I think he was right and I was wrong um there are some ideas about um you know decision making that uh people have like Ben Hayden has suggested um, that I think are probably better than some of the ideas that I held uh, dear and close. So I, I am changing my perspective, and I haven't done the experiments yet. But you know, in, mon in the monkey world, it takes a long time before you can actually get to that. Point. But I, I, I want to actually, I, and and I will, uh, you know, do experiments that are actually are inspired by these kinds of things. For all you know, I'll be recording the hippocampus and the insula. Um, you know, 10 years from now, because I, there's some interesting questions that may, may one might get to instead of just staying where, you know, we're, you know, it's kind of a good e example of the burdens of history. I have, I do the things I do because I come 
from the, you know, the, the, the training that I had. And I come from a tradition and, I'm, I, and I kind of got sort of led to, to where I am, but, but now I'm, I, I am revising. And I think people, people should, you know, you know, Grillner's already been doing this, I think very well, but you know, there's people studying zebrafish, um, you know, somebody, you, you should study the Amphioxus. Uh, if you if you could study the amphioxus, I think you would teach us all a lot of very important. I mean, it's a lot of school issues, and you know, zebrafish are actually wonderful. I think they're they're certainly understudied, um, but there's been a struggle in the field to really get the kind of behaviors that sort of. Um, they're a problem because they've changed so much along that lineage since they diverged. All teleost fish went through another genome duplication. And they have this way weird brain development where things fan out like this instead of bunk. It, 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 there's a lot of things that teleost fish came up with. Um, you know, beach ears would be better. Uh, they're they're less. They're closer to the to the. Um, they they changed less at least it's believed. So th there's certain choice of species issues. Drosophila are fascinating, but they are like like another planet. Um, I, I mean, actually, uh, just one, Paul, just, you know, you brought up Hayden's view, you know, where he, you know, argues that value doesn't need to be overtly represented. It just plays out, gets disentangled across the sensory motor chain. But, you know, that's probably quite true. But when you look at, Carlos, you know, but, well, you know, no, but when you look at sort of work in primates, like by Paolo Schioppa and others, who show very yeah. nice evidence or Matthew Rushworth, yeah. A representation of value. It just the same thing right with the rat too, by the way. Sure. But all yeah. I'm saying is, is that it's a nice example of where things can qualitatively change. Yeah, but you could make you could make a, a, a prediction about some of that. You know, like I, you know, I, I wonder whether a lot of the stuff that's in orbital frontal cortex in in rodents and prime and monkeys at least is is mostly gustatory. And 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 probably very much influenced by contextual things that don't happen in the lab. Like for example, <laughs> predators. Predators don't enter the lab, and you know, you know, you're, that you're, provides you're, a different you're, context. You're, 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 you're frontal. That's another conversation. You've, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. you've developed a deflationary reflex, which now just seems to be all out, uh, you know, but it's fine. No, I'm just asking a question. I'm just asking a question. I think these questions need to be asked. No, I, I don't no, think we can just no. say, I've defined the problem this way, and that now I've made an experiment which follows along my definition, and there's no other way to look at it, my way or the highway, you know? I think we need to think about, did I actually define the problem the right way, and what is the experiment that would tell me that? And you have to do that experiment before you can say, and maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I don't have any problem with value representations in our prefrontal cortex. I mean, you know. Okay, let's, let's I do it. Like okay. okay. uh, uh, can you please invite Iris while we are having this? Yes. Uh, um, Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Can, can, I, can I put one more thing where I was about to say before I, I get kicked off? Sure. Um, Right. So, I mean, this whole, this whole conversation around how far you take this particular evolutionary story seems to depend on how you incorporate that information into your experiments, right? Either your either a theory is incompatible with the way that you've defined evolution and you throw it out and you never consider it to begin with, or it's a regularization where you've placed it, you know, the likelihood of all your possible hypotheses with respect to evolution and whether or not it fits depends on both the evidence and the the prior right the prior of evolution and i i don't know i it seems you know from the conversation that i'm not entirely certain what is the recommendation right and i don't know if that it's you know the those who are potentially against it are really pushing this view that you are you know pushing for a strict classification of possible and impossible hypotheses or whether you're proposing like an actual like regularization where all possible hypotheses are possible however right you have this additional information you want to weigh it in proportion against the evidence that you're accumulating and you know the good old bayesian methodology but i, I wouldn't so, phrase it like that I, I would just i would just suggest how about some of us study different kinds of questions questions about transitions that are motivated by particular uh, things that may have happened in evolution. I'm just saying, let's study that and see where, where it takes us. Um, it's it's not it's not to you know to sort of pass judgment on every theory out there. I'm just telling you what I'm interested in because I think it's promising. Well, you uh, have anyway, to pass judgment I, in order to choose a direction for your research, right? 
Yeah, and I'm saying that you know I you know I'm not going to say that some somebody's theory is wrong because they don't have an evolutionary story for it. Uh, I'm saying that you know I'm interested in certain kinds of things that are motivated by I think that they reveal to me uh, and they they differentiate between different hypotheses that are both about mm -hmm. evolutionary sequences and and what the what the distinction the real distinctions are. Um, you know, so it's it's really it's it's you know. I wish more people did this kind of thing, but I'm not going to tell anybody to not do what they're doing. Um, you know. Awesome. Thanks. With that, um, I'll I'll take my exit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I, base, I completely agree that I have to respond to your orbital frontal jibe. So I yes. I have no stake in value in orbital frontal cortex. We set out to study something else, but we also found value. We found it in auditory olfactory, the same neurons represented the same things. Mm. We didn't set out to do that, but I, I sort of, uh, I, I guess I, we saw it. And, and, and this actually does get at something really important, which is that how much constraint does evolution truly provide compared to the actual day job we have, which is, you know, neurons? Because I feel like, um, you were just outlining your recommendation, but you're still going to record uh, from macaques. Well, and yes, but that's what my lab has. I mean, frankly, I was just telling Andrea, well, come, come, come come and do road wife, that we yeah, should yeah. do we should do some get some reptiles. Repti we should oh, get I some reptiles in the lab, but the, I, the monkeys are probably going to eat the reptiles. I, I love, well, you don't have to put them together, but I, I love yeah. to reptiles. But, but the but the fundamental issue mm -hmm. is that that, that you keep pushing this as an alternative. And I think that's where the fundamental well, issue maybe I shouldn't push it. Maybe I shouldn't call it an alternative because in the end, yeah, my day job is still my day job. It, it's, it's, an, I, it's a different, but it's a different philosophy that sits behind the day job, right? There's the day job of I'm going to find the system that represents, you know, something in the brain. Okay, but that, then you're, you've taken a philosophical stance to, to define your very good hard hardcore neuroscience, but that philosophical stance might not be so good. I'm saying I'm going to try to find a, a inspiration for philosophical stances that are, uh, you know, I think better grounded, and then I'm still going to do my day job, and I'm still going to try to do good. good but give us, give us an example. So I, I'd like to really see an example, and I, I mean that, that that's what I've been pushing you on. I want to I want to really do awesome. experiments. I want to do experiments that are a bit more ecologically relevant, where the task is not a monkey sitting with his head fixed playing a vi essentially a video game um, to do abstract decisions, but ra that that I've decided are interesting, uh, but rather something like you know moving from one end to the cage to the other. Don't to need evolution to tell you that, right? Sort of, you don't need evolution to. to no, you don't. You don't. So but fine. evolution might tell you where to record in. Brain. And what exactly how to design the experiment, right? Given given what people have found in reptiles and 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 fish, where might you expect? How how will you define the nitty gritty of the experiment? You'll get a lot of insight from that, I think. So how should we do our job differently because of your approach? I guess that that, that that's the bottom line. I mean, so we well, are not that differently. It's mostly about the theories, right? It's mostly the questions you ask, and and it's mostly the discussion section of the paper, right? Um, uh, you know, it's not you know. Uh, that, but that, but then it's but that, that that's not that interesting. It's it's it, it's interesting if it's really I'm going to oh, do different right. experiments. I, I realize it's different. You know, it would be really difficult to do sharks right now, you know, in the lab, right? Like that—that that would be a huge yeah. ask. But you know, um, yeah. But there are some things we could do differently, and that's kind of what I'm pushing you on because I, 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 I love <clears throat> the idea, but I feel like fundamentally, say you go to to value. That's an actually ex a great example from first principles from evolution. You could have thought it's completely distributed. It might still be. Well, let's say the basal ganglia, all right? The basal ganglia, is it involved in decisions? Is it not involved in decisions? If the basal ganglia, like I'm, uh, you know, suggesting is involved in selecting between different aspects of the behavioral repertoire, then of course it's not going to be relevant to the kind of experiments that I do in my lab in which a monkey is sitting there moving a, his arm from one, one target to another. The time that basal ganglia comes in is when the monkey says, that's it. I'm done with this task. I want to go do something else. But then my recordings are finished. So I need to do some kind of experiment where I give a monkey the option to engage in different aspects of his behavioral repertoire. And maybe then I will see decision-like signals emerging 
in the basal ganglia. I, I think the the idea of seeing you know finding the decision making center um, is is that's probably not a good idea. Um, and it, I think it's I think better ideas are ecologically founded ones like the the thing that decides whether you stay put or go somewhere else or the thing that decides whether you're going to use you know your arm to do something or 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 something else you know a different type of behavior uh, th these are these are i think actually empirically addressable questions and i plan to do them they i really do um and you know maybe i'll put you down as a potential grant reviewer or something <laughs> sure i'll need money to do it Anyway, Sharks, uh, that's where it's at. So we I tried really to get, to yeah, we got to try to get Iris, but unfortunately, there's like a bit of a. What is the problem? Is it with Iris' side or ours? She, yeah, she, her side. She she can't hear us when she joins. So I was asking her to open two browsers so that in one she's the audience and in one she can be on the mm. on the screen. So if you, you want to figure that out, just ask the poll the question when you have the opportunity. Okay, so do you want to write your question here again, Iris, so we can read your question? Um, and also, so uh, one question, I think maybe while Iris is typing her question. So Iris, would you type your question and I read another question in the meanwhile? I think it's kind of, uh, it, this one is by Jonathan Rowski and he's asking, can you comment on the relationship between phylogenetic refinement and the evolution as learning problem approach champions in the theoretical machine learning and theoretical bioliteracy, and particularly in statistical query learning and pack learning. Uh, well, I don't know what the statistical query and pack learning is, so I can't Jonathan, would that, you like but... to come on stage? So that's a very commonly known thing in machine learning, but you're, you're right that it's not a familiar uh, approach. So maybe just, um, the first part of his question, which is well, in general, in general, I think there's evolution there's, as learning. I think there's some parallels, but I think uh, one doesn't want to. Uh, I think there's a danger in translating uh, one field's concepts into the language of another field, and and I think th there's there's some pitfalls doing that with evolution. And again, uh, it has to do with the constraints um, that you know in in learning theory you think of a of a um, you think of a surface, some kind of an error surface. And in evolution, the surface is is a mess. It's it's riddled with holes and and it's like a lattice of bridges and and that are have nothing to do with fitness, but rather just to do with developmental constraints. So I think the the you know the similarity, the sort of general similarity there, but the specifics are are quite different to the point where you can't you can't just uh, easily translate from one to the other the the insights. I do think there's a parallel there. Um, but I think one needs to be uh, rather careful with it. Um, I, I think evolution, the, the, the degree to which we can reconstruct evolutionary history, and that's not like a genetic algorithm or anything, that's just looking at data, that gives tells us like, you know, what the different bridges are, et cetera, and, and, and so on. But the landscape is changing all the time. It's kind of a weird, it's a weird learning problem if you want to think of it as a learning problem. Jonathan. Yes, I didn't know I was muted. Sorry, uh, I, I only meant that there's there's work in people trying to understand uh, ev like evolutionary strategies or trajectories or whatever by viewing each strategy, for example, as an algorithm, which you can then write as some program, right? And then you're in the space of, you know, learning theory once again, right? And then you can have limits to like classes of evolutionary strategies and such like this, which was kind of, you had this distinction at the beginning of your talk between functional, I mean, computer functions, like of trying to think of things as functions and like a phylogenetic strategy. But there are people who think that they're actually just the same thing that you can describe well, using a space of functions and then algorithms for in inducing them uh, or not, right? Yeah, so, I think ultimately you both, both methods really need to be about function. It's, it's more of a, the strategy that you pursue is you don't define the functions you don't you don't define all the functions first. You sort of let evolution help you define the functions. But you're still you're still talking about functions. They're they're you know maybe ecologically based ones rather than informationally based ones, um, and and they they're sort of within a particular very specific context of a particular lineage mm -hmm. going through time. So, but it is still about function. Um, but I think the you know and of course there's genetic algorithms and and so on. And it's just that you know they're they're sufficiently different. Um, 
from evolution in part because they don't have you know the the biological evolution of our species is very much constrained by these developmental uh, things which usually don't enter into any of those theories and and so you, you, you're you not you're not you're not selecting between connectomes or something or but by, or algorithms by treating it as like a know. learning problem you use except by definition that there's a space of functions that you can learn right that's like the no free lunch type yeah. thing yeah. so that seems to me like that's the language that you want like stop messing around with terms that you can't you, you know you're going to end up semantically switching terms forever but define the space of functions that you want to induce and then say what's the class of learning strategies namely what whatever your developmental constraints but, are that but get you're, you there but you're defining but you're defining the functions first so i think then you go no, and you're not. That psychology not 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 quite no? right not quite not necessarily. You, you define the space of them right so you say yeah. what's the class of functions like do i just want computer, well, give, like, give me an example uh, yeah, so, you know, what are the functions that you could, ex so say you have a space of, um, it's not functions in the sense of like foraging, right? Like that's mm -hmm. too, that's too broad a term. It's just like, what are the exact mechanisms that you want to end up with as a, as an organism, right? And I can write that out as some program, right? I does, however, I can program it somehow. Then that's now it's a, it's a hypothesis or some, something that I can infer. And then, so I have a class of those. You know, maybe it's the, maybe it's the class of programs that are definable by finite state machines. I don't. You know, that's that's one people talk about. Or maybe it's just functions that you can program in some. It's computable functions. I don't know. Like those are the easy ones, right? But you know, some class of functions needs to be there in order to to evolve them. <laughs> but then, aren't so you I wanna, risking? I want to make a mental Aren't you point. risking exploring a space that's too big and not necessarily related to the one yes, you're interested in? Yes, but that's in? the yeah. challenge, right? That's the yeah. what's what's the right definition of space i think yeah. that but i think yeah, the theoretical well, biologists have kind of worked on that a bit i don't know much about yeah. it but i know that they've tried it i just want to make a meta point that uh, paul this is why your work is uh, popular among some machine learning folks uh, they do see a parallel because they also mm. want to but for different reasons than yours they want to entirely not read anything from the history of cognitive science and psychology and develop this kind of artificial intelligence that does all of those things because they think your work shows that you could get there with some kind of evolutionary approach, which to them translates to a learning approach. So I just want to sort of make the meta point of the kind of a maybe sociological thing where um, there might be different intentions, but your approach in concept translates to that kind of a perspective where we don't need psychology, we can throw it away, basically. Well, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say throw it away. I'm just saying, you know, just 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 look at it carefully and, and think about these, are these really the right? I ones? agree. I think that I think that you I think that you you don't think that we should throw it away. And some of them agree survive with beautifully. You. Reinforcement learning, you know, reinforcement learning is, is fundamental to to our lineage that's so, why we survived <laughs> so because we're running out of time here um and iris has written a long yeah uh, there's so much uh, stuff in it in the so chat me, that i'm going to want to need well, i'm going to read iris's to. question um and it's interesting just to say that darwin basically wrote explicitly that he admitted that understanding how the brain works and how it evolved are completely different questions and iris says here thanks for the great talk paul very interesting discussion um, some people intuition is that should necess uh, blah 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 that whether high order cognition can be understood from evolution. Yes, perhaps it's possible. This made me realize that we may be overlook overlooking the question: explain what and what counts as an explanation. If psychologists want to explain how does cognition work, or you may object and phrase it as how does control work, then evolution seems to give explanation in the wrong language. It does not say how it works, but how what it came to be. So basically, exactly, Iris, <laughs> they're, they're different questions and you're collapsing them. No, no, but the, my point is that if we, we, we can address the question of, let's say, how basic, uh, you know, uh, sensory motor control works and then expand that to a question of how more sophisticated sensory motor control works. And I do think you always want to ask the question of how it works. The, the cerebellum, the evolution of the cerebellum has been very nicely um, framed in this context by uh, uh, Montgomery and Bodznik and, and, and others in the context of actual circuit, circuitry that does things, and you can model it, et cetera, 
uh, and, and constructing it in a way that respects the evolutionary um, uh, history of it. And, and I think that's an example of answering both questions, how it works and how it came to we be. We have no but idea the point what the is, does. We have no idea what the cerebellum does. Well, there, there's, there's theories about what it does. And, you know, the forward model interpretation in, in, in a general sense is a fairly good one at least in my opinion, we can we can have a whole other learning salon about this. But but my point is that, no, you do actually answer both questions at the same time. You just don't ask the question of how human cognition and, let's say, sophisticated abstract thinking works before you've gone through some of the other stuff that's going to make a, create a context for answering the, asking that question in a better way. So I think, you know, following Piaget, that we should study how uh, children learn to interact with their world physically before we should be really before we're really qualified to ask the question of how they learn uh, cognitive concepts and such. And and I think that's kind of the same thing. You're always asking both questions, uh, and they help each other. I, I think they help each other. I think knowing how something came to be um, helps you answer how it works, if only because it reduces the space. So I. I th I think you you can deal with both. Now I do admit that getting to human cognitive abilities is is a big challenge, and that's that's you know again uh, you're limited. The method can only take you so far, but it does take you, you know, at least in years, ninety nine percent of the way there. So that's pretty good, um, I would say. Can I ask a related question? Um, so can can this approach potentially mislead? Yes, if you get the if you get the phylogenetic history wrong. Well, but I, I this just reminded me of a really important issue. Sort of one of the the obvious differences, sort of between the the measly rodent brains that we study and and primates is is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Yep. So this has led to, as you know, kind of a series of explanations where all of higher level cognition was just relegated to this one area. And, and arguably, that, that's an evolutionary approach, right? That's clearly the area that sort of doesn't have a, 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 an obvious uh, homology. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I never thought about this this way, but sort of just the discussions leading there. Of course, you mentioned that we're missing, we're missing the antecedents of, of, of us. We killed off all the Denisovians and Neanderthals. Yeah. And so it's, it's hard to do a, a careful evolutionary comparison. Um, but, but even at this broad scale, you don't think it actually could be misleading at times? Well, again, I think, um, yeah, regarding the prefrontal cortex, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of primates that survived. And you can, we have a very rich and thick tree of primates that have survived, and you can reconstruct it there. Now, um, Steve Wise. Uh, Betsy Murray and others have, have done this very nicely. They've looked at what actually happened there with uh, Dick Passingham as well. Um, and so there is actually a lot of data there to, to talk about different prefrontal areas that appeared at different stages. And, and I think you can get a lot of the way there. Uh, the human step is a tough one, uh, admittedly. But again, you know, I'll just come back to saying if we could get to prime, if we could get to great apes, we'd be in pretty good shape. Um, and yeah, but that's another that's another um, sort of vote for Gilles Laurent's point that we need to study more species. We can't just do monkeys, rats, and you know zebrafish and Drosophila. We we need to have a richer, you know, more different species of primates in particular for interest if so interested in primates or maybe study just, their different prefrontal cortex. I, I want to push back. I obviously agree. I mean, at some level, how could you not agree with with that species point? But at the same time, don't you feel like we also need to study it at the right resolution. Well, yeah. <laughs> so if you don't study it at the right, neuroscience is hard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Reason, what I'm trying to say is that there's it's not a, there's not a philosophical reason why we are not studying other species. It's because you need to study them at yeah. the right resolution. Because if you don't do that, it's unclear whether you're confirming existing concepts or you're learning and discovering something fundamentally new. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that goes back to this this issue of what what will be the deciding experiment that will help us from an evolutionary perspective. Right. So that is a very good uh, segue into the last question that I'd like to ask, which was um, Matthew uh, uh, Leavitt. 
I think that's how to pronounce it. Uh, he's asking a question that's very related to Adam's last sentence. He asks, how would you develop your evolutionary guided framework into a more practical guide for designing and conducting experiments, especially with regard to studying cognition? And he puts cognition in quotes. Um, well, I think a, a focus on transitions would be a, a, an interesting approach. In other words, um, ask questions about particular points along that uh, sort of lineage, that, that sto evolutionary story. So when something uh, appears and some functions appear, ask the question of, of, okay, is my hypothesis as to what happened here correct? And, and, but that does require studying at least two species. Um, or at least combining data across two different uh, groups of you know studies. Anyway, so I think a strategy would be to look at transitions and to to address them uh, uh, experimentally. Design the question along uh, around that, uh, and it might require a consortium of people studying different animals with the same task. Maybe um, again, there are people doing this kind of stuff. Um, just maybe not enough. Not enough of them. We should give them more funding. Um, now, and then with regard to human cognition, I think you put the quotes there um, because, um, you know, uh, because I think this is, a, again, if you define the problem that way, what if, what if there's no such thing? And, and here I would like to quote Matthew's uh, thesis, PhD thesis, um, which I happened to, to read. And he's, he asked, you know, some, I'll paraphrase because I don't remember exactly, how many years have been spent uh, doing experiments to uh, study the fanciful musings of 19th century aristocrats. Um, you know, there's kind of a tongue-in-cheek uh, attack at the idea that all the concepts of armchair philosophy, I mean, let's face it, the psychology started as the study of the psyche um, and was studied through an introspection approach. Uh, Paul, and, I have to, and many uh, of those concepts... I hate. I, I, to okay, you, but I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to go. Uh, Darwin was an aristocrat as well, by the way, Paul. Well, I have um, no problem with aristocrats. So, I'm just so, <laughs> so, in other words, uh, that to, to call psychologists yeah, aristocrats yeah. and Darwin not one is extremely biased, I think. And I um, wouldn't mind so, being an aristocrat, uh, right? Um, I actually have I, to go. This is this is um, okay. actually remarkable. Um, this is six thirty. I actually have to go. Um, by all means, Me too, everyone stay. Um, but. Uh, Thank you, everyone, especially you, Paul. You certainly Thanks. survived the slings and arrows, especially from me. But, you know, we've known each other ages. Um, Let's fantastic. do it again. Let's yes. do some more. Um, and yeah. and uh, thank you. And again, Ida, Jova, I'm allowed to go, right? You're, you're Thanks. Go? OK, all right. OK, all right. Thank you, Jova. Ciao, guys. Bye. I was in charge, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's yeah. honestly, if this I was got, a real salon, we would all hang out afterwards and have a drink. Yeah. So yeah, I, I if we don't one. have such a system here <laughs> as such. Yeah. We've gone over 32 minutes over time. It's the longest we've gone over. And I would like to give you, uh, you know, uh, uh, the last words, Paul, because we've all been extremely excited to have you here. And this has been a fantastic discussion. So please well, go I ahead. I got to tell you, I've been looking forward to this ever since you invited me. I, I really wanted to, especially given the, the, you know, the different perspectives that you all represent and, and the kind of audience that you draw. I really, I really enjoyed the one with Conrad, the one with Melanie and, and the other ones that I was able to see. So this is a great format. And uh, I think it was great. I mean, I, I know I was I must say I was afraid and not just because of John. But but also because <laughs> I noticed that some people from the JB Johnson Club were invited at least to come, and these are the people that really know the stuff. So you know, I if 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 anyone has more questions or or comments such as Paul, you've got the amniotes completely wrong. Please write to me and, and tell me that because uh, you know I'm I'm reading this stuff. Uh, I'm not doing this stuff, so you know. We're also going to have a recap session where people can come and ask uh, questions that are lingering in their mind, and we're going to summarize. And we invite all the past speakers to be there, so people can again interact with you in this. Uh, salon. Is there any way for me to address people from this? Because I'm going to go through the chat at some point, because uh, I saw there was lots of stuff on the chat. Great question. Like to get back so to you can still see the 17 questions that you have in the question area, and their mm -hmm. names are there. Yeah, And then the chat will be partially not visible after this, but I think that 
uh, Claire can, uh, she has uh, uh, miraculous capacities, Claire and Eva. E Eva, I think she managed to get the last time and I think she will get the this time too, so we can send it to you. It was I'd a fantastic I'd love to get a transcript test. actually. I'd love to get, uh, yeah, I'd love to get, I'd love to see it because you know, I see all these things there, but I don't want to ignore the person who's asking the question. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of rough to, to do this. Um, also, I just want to thank the audience. This has been a fantastic participation. I think everybody's getting better at also just showing up on screen. And uh, every week we have somebody's audio who doesn't work. But I think that overall, uh, we've been very fortunate to have this wonderful audience all these weeks. I, I feel a huge sense of community, uh, which I didn't yeah. think I would feel in an online situation. <laughs> So I wish that we could have a, yeah, I wish that you guys show up again and uh, especially come to the, oh, okay. um, yeah, mm. especially to the recap session where we can have previous speakers and people can ask those questions again. Yeah, and I would just want to, again, thank everybody for joining. Thank Worldwide Neuro for, for helping us host this. And Paul very early on mentioned Amy Artson. Uh, as it turns out, I'm organizing a conference later in October, NeuronX3.io. She's running a session on mental representations. Um, and I think it's going to be really fun. Everyone's welcome to register. Um, and uh, we should all see you next week. I'd love yeah. to see what they have. I'd love to see what they have on that because it sounded great what I heard. It should come. Right. I was at, um, I'll say, I was asked to review it, but then my review wasn't necessary. So that's how I know about it. But I, I'm sure I would have given it a big thumbs up. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everybody in the audience. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Iris. Although we hope that your uh, microphone works next time. Thank you, Claire and Eva and everybody behind the screen. Thank you for everyone who asked the question. And we hope to see you next week. Bye. Thank, thank you, Ida.